The Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope. Book 21. Argument. The Battle in the River Scamander. The Trojans fly before Achilles, some towards the town, others to the river Scamander. He falls upon the latter with great slaughter, takes twelve captives alive to sacrifice to the shade of Patroclus, and kills Lycaon and Asteropius. Scamander attacks him with all his waves. Neptune and Pallas assist the hero. Simwa joins Scamander. At length Vulcan, by the instigation of Juno, almost dries up the river. This combat ended. The other gods engage each other. Meanwhile Achilles continues the slaughter, drives the rest into Troy. Agenor only makes a stand and is conveyed away in a cloud by Apollo, who, to delude Achilles, takes upon him Agenor's shape, and while he pursues him in that disguise gives the Trojans an opportunity of retiring into their city. The same day continues, the scene is on the banks and in the stream of Scamander. And now to Xanthus, gliding stream, they drove Xanthus, immortal progeny of Jove. The river here divides the flying train, part to the town, fly diverse o'er the plain, where late their troops triumphant bore the fight, now chased and trembling in ignoble flight. These were the gathered mist Saturnia shrouds, and rolls behind the rout a heap of clouds. Pot plunge into the stream, old Xanthus roars, the flashing billows beat the whitened shores, with cries promiscuous all the banks resound, and here and there in eddies whirling round, the flouncing steeds and shrieking warriors drowned, as the scorched locusts from their fields retire, while fast behind them runs the blaze of fire, driven from the land before the smoky cloud, the clustering legions rush into the flood. So plunged in Xanthus by Achilles' force roars the resounding surge with men and horse. His bloody lance the hero casts aside, which spreading tamarisks on the margin hide. Then, like a god, the rapid billows, braves armed with his sword, high brandished o'er the waves. Now down he plunges, now he whirls it round, deep groan the waters with a dying sound. Repeated wounds the reddening river died and the warm people circled on the tide. Swift through the foamy flood the Trojans fly, and close in rocks or winding caverns lie. So the huge dolphin, tempesting the main, in shoals before him fly the scaly train. Confusedly heaped they seek their inmost caves, or pant and heave beneath the floating waves. Now tired with slaughter from the Trojan band, twelve chosen youths he drags alive to land. With their rich belts their captive arms restrains, Late their proud ornaments, but now their chains. These his attendants to the ships conveyed, Sad victims destined to Patroclus' shade. Then, as once more he plunged amid the flood, The young Lycaon in his passage stood, The son of Priam, whom the hero's hand But late made captive in his father's land. As from a sycamore his sounding steel Lopped the green arms to spoke a chariot wheel, To Lemno's isle he sold the royal slave, Where Jason's son the price demanded gave. But kind Aetion, touching on the shore, the ransomed prince to fair Arisbe bore. Ten days were passed since in his father's reign he felt the sweets of liberty again. The next, that god whom men in vain withstand, gives the same youth to the same conquering hand, now, never to return and doomed to go, a sadder journey to the shades below. His well-known face, when great Achilles eyed the helm and visor, he had cast aside with wild affright, and dropped upon the field his useless lance and unavailing shield, as trembling, panting from the stream he fled, and knocked his faltering knees, the hero said, Ye mighty gods, what wonders strike my view! Is it in vain our conquering arms subdue? Sure I shall see yon heaps of Trojans killed rise from the shades, and brave me on the field— as now the captive whom so late I bound and sold to Lemnos stalks on Trojan ground. Not him the sea's unmeasured deeps detain, that bar such numbers from their native plain. Lo, he returns. Try then, my flying spear, try, if the grave can hold the wanderer, if earth at length this active prince can seize, earth whose strong grasp has held down Hercules. Thus while he spoke, the Trojan, pale with fears, approached, and sought his knees with suppliant tears, loath as he was to yield his youthful breath, and his soul shivering at the approach of death. Achilles raised the spear, prepared to wound. He kissed his feet, extended on the ground, and while above the spear suspended stood, longing to dip its thirsty point in blood, one hand embraced them close, one stopped the dart, while thus these melting words attempt his heart. Thy well-known captive, great Achilles, see— once more, Lycaon trembles at thy knee. Some pity to a suppliant's name afford, who shares the gifts of Ceres at thy board, whom late thy conquering arm to Lemnos bore. 
far from his father, friends, and native shore. A hundred oxen were his price that day. Now sums immense thy mercy shall repay. Scarce respited from woes I yet appear, and scarce twelve morning suns have seen me here. Lo, Jove again submits me to thy hands, again her victim cruel fate demands. I sprang from Priam, and Laotho fair, old Alta's daughter, and Lelegia's heir, who held in Pedasus his famed abode, and ruled the fields where silver Satnio flowed. Two sons, alas, unhappy son, she bore, for ah, uh, one spear shall drink each brother's gore, and I succeed to slaughtered Polydor. How from that arm of terror shall I fly? Some demon urges, tis my doom to die. If ever yet soft pity touched thy mind, ah, uh, think— not me too much of Hector's kind, not the same mother gave thy suppliant breath with his who wrought thy loved Patroclus' death. These words, attended with a shower of tears, the youth addressed to unrelenting ears. Talk not of life or ransom, he replies, Patroclus dead, whoever meets me dies. In vain a single Trojan sues for grace, but least the sons of Priam's hateful race. Die then, my friend, what boots it to deplore? The great, the good Patroclus is no more. He— "'Far thy better was foredoomed to die, "'and thou dost thou bewail mortality? "'Seest thou not me, whom nature gifts adorn, "'sprung from a hero, from a goddess born? "'The day shall come, which nothing can avert, "'when by the spear, the arrow, or the dart, "'by night or day, by force or by design, "'impending death and certain fate are mine. "'Die, then,' he said, and as the word he spoke, "'the fainting stripling sank before the stroke. "'His hand forgot its grasp and left the spear, "'while all his trembling frame confessed his fear.' Sudden, Achilles his broad sword displayed, and buried in his neck the reeking blade. Prone fell the youth, and panting on the land, the gushing purpled dyed the thirsty sand. The victor to the stream the carcass gave, and thus insults him, floating on the wave. Lie there, Lycaon, let the fish surround thy bloated corpse, and suck thy gory wound. There no sad mother shall thy funerals weep, but swift Scamander roll thee to the deep whose every wave some watery monster brings to feast unpunished on the fat of kings. So perish Troy and all the Trojan line, such ruin theirs and such compassion mine. What boot ye now, Scamander's worshipped stream, is earthly honours and immortal name. In vain your emulated bulls are slain, your living courses glut his gulfs in vain. Thus he rewards you with his bitter fate. Thus, till the Grecian vengeance is complete, thus is atoned Patroclus' honoured shade, and the short absence of Achilles paid. These boastful words provoked the raging god. With fury swells the violated flood. What means divine may yet the power employ to check Achilles and to rescue Troy? Meanwhile the hero springs in arms to dare the great Asterapius to mortal war, the son of Pelagon whose lofty line flows from the source of Axia's stream divine. Fair Parabea's love that god had crowned with all his refluent waters circled round. On him Achilles rushed, he fearless stood, and shook two spears advancing from the flood. The flood impelled him on Pelides' head to avenge his waters choked with heaps of dead. Near as they drew, Achilles thus began, What, art thou boldest of the race of man? Who, or from whence, unhappy is the sire whose son encounters our resistless ire? O son of Peleus, what avails to trace, replied the warrior, our illustrious race? From rich Paeonia's valleys I command, armed with protended spears, my native band. Now shines the tenth bright morning since I came in aid of Ilion to the fields of fame, Axius, who swells with all the neighboring rills, and wide round the floated region fills, begot my sire, whose spear much glory won. Now lift thy arm, and try that hero's son. Threatening, he said, the hostile chief's advance at once, Asteropius discharged each lance, for both his dexterous hands the lance could wield. One struck but pierced not the Vulcanian shield. One raised Achilles' hand. The spouting blood spun forth. In earth a fastened weapon stood. Like lightning next the Pelean javelin flies. Its erring fury hissed along the skies. Deep in the swelling bank was driven the spear, even to the middle earth, and quivered there. Then from his side the sword Pelides drew, and on his foe with double fury flew. The foe thrice tugged and shook the rooted wood, Repulsive of his might the weapon stood. The fourth he tries to break the spear in vain. Bent as he stands, he tumbles to the plain. His belly opened with a ghastly wound. The reeking entrails pour upon the ground. Beneath the hero's feet he panting lies, And his eye darkens and his spirit flies, While the proud victor thus triumphing said, His radiant armour tearing from the dead. So ends thy glory, such the fate they prove, 
who strive presumptuous with the sons of Jove. Sprung from a river, didst thou boast thy line? But great Saturnius is the source of mine. How durst thou vaunt thy watery progeny? Of Peleus, Aeacus, and Drove am I. The race of these superior far to those, as he that thunders to the stream that flows, what rivers can, Scamander might have shown. But Jove, he dreads nor wars against his son. Even Aculus might contend in vain, and all the roaring billows of the main, the eternal ocean from whose Fountains flow the seas and rivers and the springs below. The thundering voice of Jove abhors to hear, and in his deep abysses shakes with fear. He said, then from the bank his javelin tore, and left the breathless warrior in his gore. The floating tides the bloody carcass lave, and beat against it wave succeeding wave, till rolled between the banks it lies the food of curling eels and fishes of the flood. All scattered round the stream their mightiest slain, the amazed Paeonians scour along the plain. He vents his fury on the flying crew. Thrasius, Astapus, and Mnesus slew Maidon. Thersilochus with Aeneas fell, and numbers more his lance had plunged to hell. But from the bottom of his gulf's profound commander spoke, the shores returned the sound. O first of mortals, for the gods are thine, in valour matchless and in force divine, if Jove have given thee every Trojan head, tis not on me thy rage should heap the dead. See, my choked streams no more their course can keep, nor roll their wanted tribute to the deep. Turn, then, impetuous from our injured flood, content thy slaughters could amaze a god. In human form, confessed before his eyes, the river thus, and thus the chief replies, O sacred stream, thy word we shall obey, but not till Troy the destined vengeance pay. Not till within her towers the perjured train shall pant and tremble at our arms again. Not till proud Hector, guardian of her wall, or stain this lance or see Achilles fall, he said, and drove with fury on the foe. Then to the godhead of the silver bow the yellow flood began. O son of Jove, was not the mandate of the sire above full and express, that Phoebus should employ his sacred arrows in defence of Troy, and make her conquer till Hyperion's fall in awful darkness hide the face of all? He spoke in vain. The chief, without dismay, ploughs through the boiling surge his desperate way. Then, rising in his rage above the shores, from all his deep the bellowing river roars, huge heaps of slain disgorges on the coast, and round the banks the ghastly dead are tossed, while all before the billows ranged on high, a watery bulwark screen the bands who fly, now bursting on his head with thundering sound, the falling deluge whelms the hero round. His loaded shield bends to the rushing tide. His feet upborne scarce the strong flood divide. Slittering and staggering on the border stood a spreading elm that overhung the flood. He seized a bending bough, his steps to stay. The plant, uprooted to his weight, gave way. Heaving the bank and undermining all, loud flashed the waters to the rushing fall of the thick foliage. The large trunk, displayed, bridged the rough flood across. The hero stayed on this his weight and raised upon his hand, leaped from the channel and regained the land. Then blackened the wild waves, the murmur rose. The god pursues a huge billow throws and bursts the bank, ambitious to destroy the man whose fury is the fate of Troy. He, like the warlike eagle, speeds his pace, swiftest and strongest of the aerial race. Far as a spear can fly, Achilles springs. At every bound his clanging armor rings. Now here, now there, he turns on every side and winds his course before the following tide. The waves flow after wheresoever he wheels and gather fast and murmur at his heels, so when a peasant to his garden brings soft rills of water from the bubbling springs, and calls the floods from high to bless his bowers, and feed with pregnant streams the plants and flowers, soon as he clears what air their passage stayed, and marks the future current with his spade. Swift o'er the rolling pebbles, down the hills, louder and louder purl the falling rills, before him scattering they prevent his pains, and shine in mazy wanderings o'er the plains. Still flies Achilles, but before his eyes still swift Scamander rolls where'er he flies. Not all his speed escapes the rapid floods, the first of men, but not a match for gods. Oft, as he turned the torrent to oppose and bravely try if all the powers were foes, so oft the surge in watery mountains spreads, beats on his back, or bursts upon his head. Yet dauntless, still, the adverse flood he braves, and still indignant bounds above the waves, tired by the tides, his knees relax with toil, washed from beneath him slides the slimy soil, when thus his eyes on heaven's expansion thrown, forth bursts the hero with an angry groan, is there no god Achilles to befriend, no power to avert his miserable end? 
prevent, O Jove, this ignominious date, and make my future life the sport of fate. Of all heaven's articles believed in vain, but most of Thetis must her son complain. By Phoebus' darts she prophesied my fall, in glorious arms before the Trojan wall. Oh, had I died in fields of battle warm, stretched like a hero by a hero's arm, might Hector's spear this dauntless bosom rend, and my swift soul o'ertake my slaughtered friend. Ah, no! Achilles meets a shameful fate. Oh, how unworthy of the brave and great, like some vile swain, whom on a rainy day crossing a ford the torrent sweeps away, an unregarded carcass to the sea. Neptune and Pallas haste to his relief, and thus in human form address the chief, the power of ocean first. Forbear thy fear, O son of Peleus. Lo, thy gods appear. Behold, from Jove descending to thy aid, propitious Neptune and the blue-eyed maid, stay, and the furious flood shall cease to rave. Tis not thy fate to glut his angry wave. But thou, the counsel heaven suggests, attend, nor breathe from combat, nor thy sword suspend, till Troy receive her flying sons, till all her routed squadrons pant behind their wall. Hector alone shall stand his fatal chance, and Hector's blood shall smoke upon thy lance. Thine is the glory doomed. Thus spake the gods, then swift ascended to the bright abodes. Stung with new ardour, thus by heaven impelled, he springs impetuous and invades the field, or all the expanded plain the water spread, heaved on the bounding billows danced the dead, floating midst scattered arms, while casks of gold and turned-up bucklers glittered as they rolled, high o'er the surging tide by leaps and bounds, he wades and mounts, the parted wave resounds, not a whole river stops the hero's course, while Pallas fills him with immortal force." With equal rage, indignant Xanthus roars, And lifts his billows, and o'erwhelms his shores. Then thus to Simwa, haste, my brother, flood, And check this mortal that controls a god. Our bravest heroes else shall quit the fight, And Ilion tumble from her towery height. Call then thy subject streams, and bid them roar, From all thy fountains swell thy watery store, With broken rocks and with a load of dead, Charge the black surge, and pour it on his head. Mark how resistless through the floods he goes, And boldly bids the warring gods be foes. But nor that force nor form divine to sight Shall aught avail him if our rage unite. Whelmed under our dark gulfs, those arms shall lie, That blaze so dreadful in each Trojan eye. And deep beneath a sandy mountain hurled, Immersed remain this terror of the world. Such ponderous ruin shall confound the place. No Greek shall heir his perished relics grace. No hand his bones shall gather or inhume. These his cold rites, and this his watery tomb. He said, and on the chief descends amain, Increased with gore and swelling with the slain. Then, murmuring from his beds, he boils, he raves, And a foam whitens on the purple waves. At every step before Achilles stood, The crimson surge and deluged him with blood. Fear touched the queen of heaven. She saw dismayed. She called aloud and summoned Vulcan's aid. Rise to the war. The insulting flood requires thy wasteful arm. Assemble all thy fires, while to their aid by our command enjoin rush the swift eastern and the western wind. These from old ocean at my word shall blow. Pour the red torrent on the watery foe. Courses and arms to one bright ruin turn, and hissing rivers to their bottoms burn. Go, mighty in thy rage, display thy power, drink the whole flood, the crackling trees devour, scorch all the banks, and, till our voice reclaim, exert the unwearied furies of the flame. The power, ignipotent, her word obeys, wide, o'er the plain he pours the boundless blaze, at once consumes the dead and dries the soil, and the shrunk waters in their channel boil, as when autumnal boreas sweeps the sky, and instant blows the watered gardens dry, so looked the field. So whitened was the ground, while Vulcan breathed the fiery blast around. Swift on the sedgy reeds the ruin preys, along the margin winds the running blaze. The trees in flaming rose to ashes turn, the flowering lotus and the tamarisk burn, broad elm and cypress rising in a spire. The watery willows hiss before the fire. Now glow the waves, the fishes pant for breath, the eels lie twisting in the pangs of death. Now flounce aloft, now dive the scaly fry, or grasping turn the bellies to the sky. At length the river reared his languid head, and thus short panting to the guard he said, O Vulcan, O what power resists thy might? I faint, I sink, unequal to the fight, I yield. Let Elian fall, if fate decree. Ah, bend no more thy fiery arms on me. He ceased. Wide. Conflagration blazing round, the bubbling waters yield a hissing sound, as when the flames beneath a cauldron rise, to melt the fat of some rich sacrifice. Amid the fierce embrace of circling fires, the waters foam, 
the heavy smoke aspires, Shall boils the imprisoned flood, forbid to flow, And choked with vaporous feels his bottom glow. To Juno, then, imperial queen of air, The burning river sends his earnest prayer. Ah, oh, why, Saturnia, must thy son engage me, Only me, with all his wasteful rage? On other gods his dreadful arm employ, For mightier gods assert the cause of Troy. Submissive I desist, if thou command, But, ah, withdraw this all-destroying hand. Hear then my solemn oath to yield to fate unaided Ilion and her destined state, till Greece shall gird her with destructive flame, and in one ruin sink the Trojan name. His warm entreaty touched Saturnia's ear. She bade the ignipotent his rage forbear. Recall the flame, nor in a mortal cause infest a god. The obedient flame withdraws. Again the branching streams begin to spread, and soft remurmur in their wonted bed. While these by Juno's will the strife resign, the warring gods and fierce contention join. Rekindling rage, each heavenly breast alarms, with horrid clangor shock the ethereal arms. Heaven in loud thunder bids the trumpet sound, and wide beneath them groans the rending ground. Jove, as his sport, the dreadful scene descries, and views contending gods with careless eyes. The power of battles lifts his brazen spear, and first assaults the radiant queen of war. What moved thy madness thus to disunite ethereal minds and mix all heaven in fight? What wonder this when in thy frantic mood thou drovest a mortal to insult a god? Thy impious hand tidied his javelin bore, and madly bathed it in celestial gore. He spoke, and smote the long-resounding shield, which bears Jove's thunder on its dreadful field, the adamantine aegis of her sire that turns the glancing bolt and forked fire, then heaved the goddess in her mighty hand a stone, the limit of the neighbouring land, they are fixed from eldest times, black, craggy, vast. This at the heavenly homicide she cast. Thundering he falls, a mass of monstrous size, and seven broad acres covers as he lies. The stunning stroke his stubborn nerves abound. Loud all the fields his ringing arms resound. The scornful dame her conquest views with smiles, and glorying thus the prostrate god reviles. Hast thou not yet insatiate fury, known how far Minerva's force transcends thy own? Juno, whom thou rebellious darest withstand, corrects thy folly thus by Pallas' hand, thus meets thy broken faith with just disgrace, and partial aid to Troy's perfidious race. The goddess spoke, and turned her eyes away, that beaming round diffused celestial day, Jove's Cyprian daughter, stooping on the land, lent to the wounded god her tender hand. Slowly he rises, scarcely breathes with pain, and propped on her fair arm forsakes the plain. This the bright empress of the heavens surveyed, and scoffing thus to war's victorious maid. Lo, what an aid on Mars's side is seen, the smiles and love's unconquerable queen. Mark with what insolence in open view she moves, let Pallas, if she dares, pursue. Minerva, smiling, heard, the pair o'ertook, and slightly on her breast the wanton struck. She unresisting fell, her spirits fled, on earth together lay the lovers spread, and like these heroes be the fate of all, Minerva cries, who guard the Trojan wall. Do Grecian gods such let the Phrygian be, so dread, so fierce as Venus is to me? Then from the lowest stone shall Troy be moved. Thus she and Juno with a smile approved. Meantime, to mix in more than mortal fight, the god of ocean dares the god of light. What sloth has seized us when the fields around ring with conflicting powers, and heaven returns the sound? Shall ignominious we with shame retire, no deed perform to our Olympian sire? Come, prove thy arm, for first the war to wage suits not my greatness or superior age. Rash as thou art, to prop the Trojan throne, forgetful of my wrongs and of thy own, and guard the race of proud Laomedon, hast thou forgot how at the monarch's prayer we shared the lengthened labours of a year? Troy walls I raised, for such were Jove's commands, and yon proud bulwarks grew beneath my hands. Thy task it was to feed the bellowing droves along fair Ida's vales and pendant groves. But when the circling seasons in their train brought back the grateful day that crowned our pain, with menace stern the fraudful king defied our latent godhead and the prize denied. Mad as he was, he threatened servile bands, and doomed us exiles far in barbarous lands. Incensed, we heavenward fled with swiftest wing, and destined vengeance on the perjured king. Dost thou for this afford proud Ilian grace, and not, like us, infest the faithless race? Like us their present future sons destroy, and from its deep foundations heave their Troy? Apollo thus. To combat for mankind ill suits the wisdom of celestial mind, for what is man? Calamitous by birth they owe their life and nourishment to earth. 
like yearly leaves that now with beauty crown smile on the sun now wither on the ground, to their own hands commit the frantic scene, nor mix immortals in a cause so mean. Then turns his face far beaming heavenly fires, and from the senior power submiss retires, him thus retreating Artemis upraids the quivered huntress of the sylvan shades. And is it thus the youthful Phoebus flies, and yields to ocean's hoary sire the prize? How vain that martial pomp and dreadful show of pointed arrows in the silver bow! Now boast no more in yon celestial bower, thy force can match the great earth-shaking power. Silent, he heard the queen of woods upbraid. Not so, Saturnia, bore the vaunting maid. But furious thus, what insolence has driven thy pride to face the majesty of heaven? What, though by Jove the female plague design, fierce to the feeble race of womankind, the wretched matron feels thy piercing dart, thy sexist tyrant with a tiger's heart. What, though tremendous in the woodland chase, thy certain arrows pierce the savage race, how dares thy rashness on the powers divine employ those arms, or match thy force with mine? Learn hence no more unequal war to wage, she said, and seized her wrists with eager rage. These, in her left hand locked, her right untied, the bow, the quiver, and its plumy pride. About her temples flies the busy bow, now here, now there, she winds her from the blow, the scattering arrows rattling from the case drop round and idly mark the dusty place. Swift from the field the baffled huntress flies, and scarce restrains the torrent in her eyes. So, when the falcon wings her way above to the cleft cavern speeds the gentle dove, not fated yet to die, there safe retreats, yet still her heart against the marble beats. To her Latona hastes with tender care, whom Hermes, viewing, thus declines the war, how shall I face the dame who gives delight to him whose thunders blacken heaven with night? Go, matchless goddess, triumph in the skies, and boast my conquest while I yield the prize. He spoke and passed. Latona, stooping low, collects the scattered shafts and fallen bow, that glittering on the dust lay here and there, dishonoured relics of Diana's war. Then swift pursued her to her blessed abode, where, all confused, she sought the sovereign god, weeping, she grasped his knees, the ambrosial vest shook with her sighs, and panted on her breast. The sire superior smiled and bade her show what heavenly hand had caused his daughter's woe. Abashed, she names his own imperial spouse, and the pale crescent fades upon her brows. Thus they above, while swiftly gliding down, Apollo enters Ilion's sacred town. The guardian god now trembled for her wall, and feared the Greeks, though fate forbade her fall, Back to Olympus from the war's alarms return the shining bands of gods in arms, some proud in triumph, some with rage on fire, and take their thrones around the ethereal sire. Through blood, through death, Achilles still proceeds, o'er slaughtered heroes and o'er rolling steeds, as when avenging flames with fury driven on guilty towns exert the wrath of heaven. The pale inhabitants, some fall, some fly, and the red vapours purple all the sky. So raged Achilles' death and dire dismay, and toils and terrors filled the dreadful day. High on a turret, hoary Priam stands, and mocks the waste of his destructive hands, views from his arm the Trojan scattered flight, and the near hero rising on his sight. No stop, no check, no aid, with feeble pace and settled sorrow on his aged face, fast as he could, he, sighing, quits the walls, and thus descending on the guard he calls. You, to whose care our city gates belong, set wide your portals to the flying throng, for lo, he comes with unresisted sway, he comes and desolation marks his way. But when within the walls our troops take breath, lock fast the brazen bars and shut out death. Thus charged, the reverend monarch, wide were flung the opening folds, the sounding hinges rung, Phoebus rushed forth the flying bands to meet, struck slaughter back, and covered the retreat. On heaps the Trojans crowd to gain the gate, and gladsome see their last escape from fate. Thither, all parched with thirst, a heartless train, hoary with dust, they beat the hollow plain, and gasping, panting, fainting, labour on with heavier strides that lengthen toward the town. Enraged Achilles follows with his spear, wild with revenge, insatiable of war. Then, had the Greeks eternal praise acquired, and Troy inglorious to her walls retired, but he, the god who darts ethereal flame, shot down to save her and redeem her fame. To young Agenor, force divine he gave, Antenor's offspring, haughty, bold, and brave. In aid of him, beside the beach he sate, and wrapped in clouds restrained the hand of fate, when now the generous youth Achilles spies, thick beaches hot, 
the troubled motions rise. So, ere a storm the waters heave and roll, he stops and questions thus his mighty soul. What? Shall I fly this terror of the plain, like others fly, and be like others slain? Vain hope to shun him by the selfsame road, yon line of slaughtered Trojans lately trod? No. With a common heap I scorn to fall. What have they passed me to the Trojan war, while I decline to yonder path that leads to Ida's forests and surrounding shades? So, may I reach concealed the cooling flood, from my tired body wash the dirt and blood, as soon as night her dusky veil extends, return in safety to my Trojan friends. What if? But wherefore all this vain debate? Stand I to doubt within the reach of fate? Even now, perhaps, ere yet I turn the wall, the fierce Achilles sees me, and I fall. Such is his swiftness. Tis in vain to fly, and such is valour, that who stands must die. Howe'er tis better fighting for the state, here and in public view, to meet my fate. Yet sure he too is mortal. He may feel, like all the sons of earth, the force of steel. One only soul informs that dreadful frame, and Jove's sole favour gives him all his fame, he said and stood collected in his might, and all his beating bosom claimed the fight. So from some deep grown wood a panther starts, roused from his thicket by a storm of darts, untaught to fear or fly, he hears the sounds of shouting hunters and of clamorous hounds. Though struck, though wounded, scarce perceives the pain, and the barbed javelin stings his breast in vain. On their whole war untamed the savage flies, and tears his hunter or beneath him dies, not less resolved. Antenor's valiant heir confronts Achilles and awaits the war. Disdainful of retreat, high held before his shield a broad circumference he bore. Then, graceful as he stood in act to throw the lifted javelin, thus bespoke the foe. How proud Achilles glories in his fame, and hopes this day to sink the Trojan name beneath her ruins. Know that hope is vain." A thousand woes, a thousand toils remain, parents and children our just arms employ, and strong and many are the sons of Troy. Great as thou art, even thou mayest stain with gore these Phrygian fields, and press a foreign shore, he said. With matchless force the javelin flung smote on his knee, the hollow quishes rung beneath the pointed steel. But safe from harms he stands impassive in the ethereal arms. Then, fiercely rushing on the daring foe, his lifted arm prepares the fatal blow, but jealous of his fame, Apollo shrouds the godlike Trojan in a veil of clouds. Safe from pursuit, and shut from mortal view, dismissed with fame, the favoured youth withdrew. Meanwhile, the god, to cover their escape, assumes Agenor's habit, voice and shape, flies from the furious chief in this disguise. The furious chief still follows where he flies. Now all the fields they stretch with lengthened strides. Now urge the course where swift Scamander glides. The god... Now distant, scarce astride before, tempts his pursuit, and wheels about the shore, while all the flying troops their speed employ, and pour on heaps into the walls of Troy. No stop, no stay, no thought to ask or tell, who escaped by flight, or who by battle fell. T'was tumult all, and violence of flight, and sudden joy confused, and mixed affright. Pale Troy against Achilles shuts her gate, and nations breathe, delivered from their fate." The end of Book 21 of The Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope. Read by Rick Kistner for Lit to Go on the Web at fcit.usf.edu. The Iliad by Homer. Translated by Alexander Pope. Book 22. Argument. The Death of Hector. The Trojans being safe within the walls, Hector only stays to oppose Achilles. Priam is struck at his approach and tries to persuade his son to re-enter the town. Hecuba joins her entreaties, but in vain. Hector consults within himself what measures to take, but at the advance of Achilles his resolution fails him and he flies. Achilles pursues him thrice around the walls of Troy. The gods debate concerning the fate of Hector. At length Minerva descends to the aid of Achilles. She deludes Hector in the shape of Deiphobus. He stands the combat and is slain. Achilles drags the dead body at his chariot in the sight of Priam and Hecuba. Their lamentations, tears, and despair. Their cries reach the ears of Andromache, who, ignorant of this, was retired into the inner part of the palace. She mounts up to the walls and beholds her dead husband. She swoons at the spectacle, her excess of grief and lamentation. The thirtieth day still continues. The scene lies under the walls and on the battlements of Troy." Thus to their bulwarks, smit with panic fear, the herded Ilians rush like driven deer. They are safe, they wipe the briny drops away, and drown in bowls the labours of the day. 
close to the walls, advancing o'er the fields, beneath one roof of well-compacted shields, march bending on the Greeks' embodied powers, far stretching in the shade of Trojan towers. Great Hector singly stayed, chained down by fate. There, fixed he stood before the Scaean gate. Still his bold arms determined to employ the guardian still of long-defended Troy. Apollo, now to tired Achilles, turns. The power confessed in all his glory burns. And what, he cries, has Pallas' son in view, with mortal speed a godhead to pursue? For not to thee to know the gods is given, unskilled to trace the latent marks of heaven. What boots thee now that Troy forsook the plain? Vain thy past labour and thy present vain. Safe in their walls are now her troops bestowed, while here thy frantic rage attacks a god. The chief incensed, too partial god of day, to check my conquests in the middle way, how few an Ilion else had refuge found. What gasping numbers now had bit the ground, thou robbest me of a glory justly mine, powerful of godhead, not of fraud divine, mean fame, alas, for one of heavenly strain, to cheat a mortal who repines in vain. Then, to the city, terrible and strong, with high and haughty steps he towered along, through the proud courser, victor of the prize, to the near goal with double ardour flies, him, as he blazing shot across the field, the careful eyes of Priam first beheld, not half so dreadful rises to the sight, through the thick gloom of some tempestuous night, Orion's dog, the year when autumn weighs, and o'er the feebler stars exerts his rays, terrific glory, for his burning breath taints the red air with fevers, plagues, and death. So flamed his fiery mail, then wept the sage, he strikes his reverend head, now white with age, he lifts his withered arms, obtests the skies, he calls his much-loved son with feeble cries, the son, resolved Achilles' force to dare, fool at the Scaean gates, expects the war, while the sad father on the rampart stands, and thus adjures him with extended hands, ah, stay not, stay not, godless and alone, Hector, my loved, my dearest, bravest son, methinks already I behold thee slain, and stretched beneath that fury of the plain, implacable Achilles, mightest thou be to all the gods no dearer than to me. Thee, vultures wild, should scatter round the shore, and bloody dogs grow fiercer from thy gore. How many valiant sons I late enjoyed, valiant in vain, by thy cursed arm destroyed, or worse than slaughtered, sold in distant isles to shameful bondage and unworthy toils. Two, while I speak, my eyes in vain explore. Two from one mother sprung, my Polydor, and loved Lycaon, now perhaps no more. Oh, if in yonder hostile camp they live, what heaps of gold, what treasures would I give? Their grandsire's wealth, by right of birth their own, consigned his daughter with the liege's throne. But if, which heaven forbid already lost, all pale they wander on the Stygian coast, what sorrows then must their sad mother know? What anguish I, unutterable woe! Yet less than anguish, less to her, to me, less to all Troy, if not deprived of thee. Yet shun, Achilles, enter yet the wall, and spare thyself, thy father, spare us all, save thy dear life, or if a soul so brave, neglect that thought, thy dearer glory save. Pity while yet I live these silver hairs, while yet thy father feels the woes he bears, yet cursed with sense a wretch, whom in his rage, all trembling on the verge of helpless age, great, Jove has placed sad spectacle of pain, the bitter dregs of fortune's cup to drain, to fill with scenes of death his closing eyes, and number all his days by miseries. My hero slain, my bridal bed all turned, my daughters ravished, and my city burned, my bleeding infants dashed against the floor, these I have yet to see, perhaps yet more, perhaps even I reserved by angry fate the last sad relic of my ruined state. Dire pomp of sovereign wretchedness must fall, and stain the pavement of my regal hall, where famished dogs, late guardians of my door, shall lick their mangled master's spattered gore. Yet for my sons I thank ye gods, tis well. Well have they perished, for in fight they fell. Who dies in youth and vigour dies the best, struck through with wounds all honest on the breast. But when the fates in fullness of their rage spurn the horror head of unresisting age, in dust the reverend lineaments deform, and pour to dogs the lifeblood scarcely warm, this, this is misery, the last, the worst, that man can feel man fated to be cursed. He said, and acting what no words could say, rent from his head the silver locks away. With him the mournful mother bears a pot, yet all her sorrows turn not Hector's heart. The zone unbraced her bosom she displayed, and thus, fast falling the salt tears, she said, Have mercy on me, O my son! 
Revere the words of age, attend a parent's prayer. If ever thee in these fond arms I pressed, or stilled thy infant clamours at this breast, ah, do not thus our helpless years forego, but by our wall secured repel the foe. Against his rage, if singly thou proceed, shouldst thou, but heaven avert it, shouldst thou bleed, nor must thy course lie honoured on the bier, nor spouse nor mother grace thee with a tear. Far from our pious rites those dear remains must feast the vultures on the naked plains. So they while down their cheeks the torrents roll. But fixed remains the purpose of his soul. Resolved he stands, and with a fiery glance expects the hero's terrible advance. So, rolled up in his den, the swelling snake beholds the traveller approach the break. When fed with noxious herbs, his turgid veins have gathered half the poisons of the plains. He burns, he stiffens with collected ire, and his red eyeballs glare with living fire. Beneath a turret on his shield reclined, he stood and questioned thus his mighty mind. Where lies my way? To enter in the wall? Honour and shame the ungenerous thought recall. Shall proud Polydemus before the gate proclaim his counsels are obeyed too late, which timely followed but the former night? What numbers had been saved by Hector's flight? That wise advice rejected with disdain, I feel my folly and my people slain. Methinks my suffering country's voice I hear, but most her worthless sons insult my ear." On my rash courage charge the chance of war, and blame those virtues which they cannot share. No, if I e'er return, return I must, glorious, my country's terror laid in dust. Or if I perish, let her see me fall, in field at least, and fighting for her wall. And yet suppose these measures I forego, approach unarmed, and parley with the foe. The warrior shield the helm and lance lay down, and treat on terms of peace to save the town. The wife withheld the treasure ill-detained, cause of the war and grievance of the land, with honourable justice to restore, and add half Ilion's yet remaining store, which Troy shall, sworn, produce that injured Greece may share our wealth, and leave our walls in peace. But why this thought? Unarmed, if I should go, what hope of mercy from this vengeful foe? But woman like to fall, and fall without a blow? We greet not here as man conversing man met at an oak, or journeying o'er a plain. No season now for calm familiar talk, like youths and maidens in an evening walk, ward as our business, but to whom is given to die or triumph that determined heaven? Thus pondering, like a god, the Greek drew nigh. His dreadful plumage nodded from on high, the Pelian javelin in his better hand, shot trembling rays that glittered o'er the land, and on his breast the beamy splendour shone like Jove's own lightning or the rising sun. As Hector sees unusual terrors rise, struck by some god he fears, recedes and flies, he leaves the gates, he leaves the wall behind, Achilles follows like the winged wind. Thus at the panting dove a falcon flies, the swiftest racer of the liquid skies, just when he holds or thinks he holds his prey, obliquely wheeling through the aerial way with open beak and shrilling cries he springs and aims his claws and shoots upon his wings. No less foreright the rapid chase they held, one urged by fury, one by fear impelled, now circling round the walls their course maintain, where the high watch-tower overlooks the plain, now where the fig-trees spread their umbrage broad, a wider compass, smoke along the road, next by Scamander's double source they bound, where two famed fountains burst the parted ground, this hot through scorching cleft is seen to rise, with exhalation streaming to the skies, that the green banks in summer's heat o'erflows, like crystal cleared and cold as winter snows, each gushing fount, a marble cistern fills, whose polished bed receives the falling rills, where Trojan dames, ere yet alarmed by Greece, washed their fair garments in the days of peace. By these they passed, one chasing one in flight, the mighty fled pursued by stronger might. Swift was the course, no vulgar prize they play, no vulgar victim must reward the day, such as in races crown the speedy strife. The prize contended was great Hector's life, as when some hero's funerals are decreed in grateful honour of the mighty dead, where high rewards the vigorous youth in flame, some golden tripod or some lovely dame. The panting courses swiftly turn the goal, and with them turns the raised spectator's soul. Thus, three times round the Trojan wall they fly, the gazing gods lean forward from the sky, to whom, while eager on the chase they look, the sire of mortals and immortals spoke. Unworthy sight, the man beloved of heaven, behold, in glorious round yon city driven— my heart partakes the generous Hector's pain, Hector, whose zeal whole hecatombs has slain, whose grateful fumes the gods received with joy, from Ida's summits and the towers of Troy, now see him flying to his fears resigned, and fate and fierce Achilles close behind, 
consult ye powers, tis worthy your debate, whether to snatch him from impending fate, or let him bear by stern Pelides slain, good as he is, the lot imposed on man. Then Pallas spoke. Shall he whose vengeance forms the forky bolt and blackens heaven with storms, shall he prolong one Trojan's forfeit breath, a man, a mortal preordained to death, and will no murmurs fill the courts above, no gods indignant blame their partial Jove? Go then, returned the sire, without delay, exert thy will, I give the fates their way, Swift at the mandate, please, Tritonia flies, and stoops impetuous from the cleaving skies, as through the forest o'er the vale and lawn the well-breathed beagle drives the flying fawn. In vain he tries the covert of the brakes, or deep beneath the trembling thicket shakes, sure of the vapour and the tainted dews, the certain hound his various maze pursues. Thus, step by step, where'er the Trojan wheeled there, swift Achilles compassed round the field— Oft, as to reach the Dardan gates, he bends, and hopes the assistance of his pitying friends, whose showering arrows as he coursed below from the high turrets might oppress the foe. So oft Achilles turns him to the plain, he eyes the city, but he eyes in vain. As men in slumber seem with speedy pace, one to pursue and one to lead the chase, they are sinking limbs the fancied course forsake. Nor this can fly, nor that can overtake, no less the labouring heroes pant and strain, while that but flies and this pursues in vain. What god, O oh muse, assisted Hector's force with fate itself so long to hold the course? Phoebus it was, who in his latest hour endued his knees with strength, his nerves with power, and great Achilles, lest some Greeks advance, should snatch the glory from his lifted lance, signed to the troops to yield his foe the way, and leave untouched the honours of the day. Jove lifts the golden balances that show the fates of mortal men, and things below— here each contending hero's lot he tries, and weighs with equal hand their destinies. Lo, sinks the scale surcharged with Hector's fate. Heavy with death it sinks, and hell receives the weight. Then Phoebus left him. Fierce Minerva flies to stern Pelides, and triumphing cries, O loved of Jove, this day our labours cease, and conquest blazes with full beams on Greece. Great Hector falls, that Hector, famed so far, drunk with renown, insatiable of war, falls by thy hand and mine. Nor force nor flight shall more avail him, nor his god of light. See where in vain he supplicates above, rolled at the feet of unrelenting Jove. Rest here, myself will lead the Trojan on, and urge to meet the fate he cannot shun. Her voice divine, the chief with joyful mind obeyed, and rested on his lance reclined, while, like Deophobus, the martial dame, her face, her gesture, and her arms the same, in show and aid by hapless Hector's side approached, and greets him thus with voice belied. Too long, O Hector, have I borne the sight of this distress, and sorrowed in thy flight. It fits us now a noble stand to make, and here as brothers equal fates partake. Then he, O prince, allied in blood and fame, dearer than all that own a brother's name, of all that Hecuba to Priam bore, long tried, long loved, much loved, but honoured more. Since you, of all our numerous race alone, defend my life regardless of your own. Again, the goddess. Much my father's prayer and much my mother's pressed me to forbear. My friends embraced my knees, adjured my stay, but stronger love impelled and I obey. Come then, the glorious conflict let us try. Let the steel sparkle and the javelin fly, or let us stretch Achilles on the field, or to his arm our bloody trophies yield. Fraudful, she said, then swiftly marched before. The Dardan hero shuns his foe no more. Sternly they met. The silence Hector broke. His dreadful plumage nodded as he spoke. Enough, O son of Peleus. Troy has viewed her walls thrice circled and her chief pursued. But now some god within me bids me try thine or my fate. I kill thee or I die. Yet on the verge of battle let us stay, and for a moment's space suspend the day. Let heaven's high powers be called to arbitrate. The just conditions of this stern debate. Eternal witnesses of all below, and faithful guardians of the treasured vow, to them I swear, if victor in the strife, Jove by these hands shall shed thy noble life. No vile dishonour shall thy course pursue, stripped of its arms alone, the conquerors do, the rest to Greece uninjured I'll restore. Now plight thy mutual oath, I ask no more. Talk not of oaths, the dreadful chief replies, while anger flashed from his disdainful eyes, detested as thou art and ought to be, nor oath nor pact Achilles plights with thee. Such 
packed as lambs and rabid wolves combine, such leagues as men and furious lions join, to such I call the gods, one constant state of lasting rancor and eternal hate, no thought but rage and never ceasing strife, till death extinguish rage and thought and life. Rouse then thy forces this important hour, collect thy soul and call forth all thy power, no further subterfuge, no further chance, tis Pallas. Pallas gives thee to my lance. Each Grecian ghost, by thee deprived of breath, now hovers round and calls thee to thy death. He spoke, and launched his javelin at the foe, but Hector shunned the meditated blow. He stooped, while o'er his head the flying spear sang innocent, and spent its force in air. Minerva watched it falling on the land, then drew, and gave to great Achilles' hand, unseen of Hector, who, elate with joy, now shakes his lance and braves the dread of Troy. The life you boasted to that javelin given, prince, you have missed. My fate depends on heaven. To thee, presumptuous as thou art unknown, or what must prove my fortune or thy own, boasting is but an art our fears to blind, and with false terrors sink another's mind. But no, whatever fate I am to try, by no dishonest wound shall Hector die. I shall not fall a fugitive at least. My soul shall bravely issue from my breast. But first, Try thou my arm, and may this dart and all my country's woes deep buried in thy heart. The weapon flew, its course unerring held, unerring, but the heavenly shield repelled the mortal dart, resulting with a bound from off the ringing orb, it struck the ground. Hector beheld his javelin fall in vain, nor other lance, nor other hope remain. He calls Deiphobus, demands a spear, in vain, for no Deiphobus was there. All comfortless he stands, then with a sigh. "'Tis so. Heaven wills it, and my hour is nigh. I deemed Deiphobus had heard my call. But he secure lies guarded in the wall. A god deceived me, Pallas. T'was thy deed. Death and black fate approach. Tis I must bleed. No refuge now, no succour from above. Great Jove deserts me, and the son of Jove, propitious once and kind. Then welcome fate, tis true, I perish. Yet I perish great. Yet in a mighty deed I shall expire. Let future ages hear it and admire. Fierce at the word his weighty sword he drew, And all collected on Achilles flew. So Jove's bold bird, high balanced in the air, Stoops from the clouds to trust the quivering hair, Nor less Achilles his fierce soul prepares. Before his breast the flaming shield he bears, Refulgent orb, above his fourfold cone, The gilded horsehair sparkled in the sun, Nodding at every step, Vulcanian frame. And as he moved, his figure seemed on flame, as radiant Hesper shines with keener light, far beaming o'er the silver host of night, when all the starry train emblazed the sphere, so shone the point of great Achilles' spear. In his right hand he waves the weapon round, eyes the whole man, and meditates the wound. But the rich male Patroclus lately wore, securely cased the warrior's body, or one space at length he spies, to lead in fate, where twixt the neck and throat the jointed plate gave entrance. Through that penetrable part, furious he drove the well-directed dart, nor pierced the windpipe yet, nor took the power of speech, unhappy from the dying hour. Prone on the field the bleeding warrior lies, while thus triumphing stern Achilles cries, at last is Hector stretched upon the plain, who feared no vengeance, for Patrick was slain. Then, prince, you should have feared what now you feel. Achilles absent was Achilles still, Yet a short space the great avenger stayed, Then low in dust thy strength and glory laid. Peaceful he sleeps, with all our rights adorned, Forever honoured, and forever mourned, While cast to all the rage of hostile power, Thee birds shall mangle and the gods devour. Then Hector, fainting at the approach of death, By thy own soul, by those who gave thee breath, By all the sacred prevalence of prayer, Oh, leave me not for Grecian dogs to tear, the common rites of sepulture bestow to soothe a father and a mother's woe. Let their large gifts procure an urn at least, and Hector's ashes in his country rest. No, wretch accursed, relentless he replies, flames as he spoke shot flashing from his eyes. Not those who gave me breath should bind me spare, nor all the sacred prevalence of prayer. Could I myself the bloody banquet join? No, to the dogs that carcass I resign." Should Troy to bribe me bring forth all her store, and giving thousands offer thousands more, should Darden, Priam, and his weeping dame drain their whole realm to buy one funeral flame, there Hector on the pile they should not see, nor rob the vultures of one limb of thee. Then thus the chief his dying accents drew, thy rage implacable too, well I knew, the furies that relentless breast have steeled, and cursed thee with a heart that cannot yield. 
yet think a day will come when fate's decree and angry gods shall wreak this wrong on thee. Phoebus and Paris shall avenge my fate, and stretch thee here before the Scaean gate. He ceased. The fates suppressed his laboring breath, and his eyes stiffened at the hand of death. To the dark realm the spirit wings its way, the manly body left a load of clay, and plaintive glides along the dreary coast, a naked, wandering, melancholy ghost. Achilles, musing as he rolled his eyes, o'er the dead hero thus unheard replies, Die thou the first, when Jove and heaven ordain, I follow thee, he said, and stripped the slain. Then, forcing backward from the gaping wound, the reeking javelin cast it on the ground. The thronging Greeks behold with wondering eyes his manly beauty and superior size, while some, ignobler, the great dead, deface with wounds ungenerous or with taunts disgrace. How changed that Hector, who, like Jove of late, sent lightning on our fleets and scattered fate! High o'er the slain the great Achilles stands, begirt with heroes and surrounding bands, and thus aloud, while all the host attends, princes and leaders, countrymen and friends, since now at length the powerful will of heaven, the dire destroyer to our arm has given, is not Troy fallen already? Haste ye powers, see if already their deserted towers are left unmanned, or if they yet retain the souls of heroes, their great Hector slain. But what is Troy, or glory, what to me? Or why reflect my mind on aught but thee, divine Patroclus? Death hath sealed his eyes, unwept, unhonoured, uninterred he lies. Can his dear image from my soul depart, long as the vital spirit moves my heart? If in the melancholy shades below the flames of friends and lovers cease to glow, yet mine shall sacred last, mine undecayed, burn on through death, and animate my shade. Meanwhile ye sons of Greece in triumph bring the corpse of Hector, and your paeans sing, be this the song slow moving toward the shore, Hector is dead, and Ilion is no more. Then his fell soul, a thought of vengeance bred, unworthy of himself and of the dead, the nervous fancies bored, his feet he bound with thongs inserted through the double wound, these fixed up high behind the rolling wain, his graceful head was trailed along the plain, proud on his car the insulting victor stood, and bore aloft his arms, distilling blood. He smites the steeds, the rapid chariot flies, the sudden clouds of circling dust arise. Now lost is all that formidable air, the face divine and long descending hair, purple the ground and streak the sable sand, deformed, dishonoured in his native land, given to the rage of an insulting throng, and in his parrot's sight now dragged along. The mother first beheld with sad survey, she rent her tresses, venerable, grey, and cast far off the regal veils away. With piercing shrieks his bitter fate she moans, while the sad father answers groans with groans. Tears after tears his mournful cheeks o'erflow, and the whole city wears one face of woe. No less than if the rage of hostile fires, from her foundations curling to her spires, or the proud citadel at length should rise, and the last blaze send Ilion to the skies, the wretched monarch of the falling state, distracted, presses to the Darden gate. Scarce the whole people stop his desperate course, while strong affliction gives the feeble force, grief tears his heart, and drives him to and fro in all the raging impotence of woe. At length he rolled in dust, and thus begun imploring all, and naming one by one, all oh, let me go, let me go, where sorrow calls. I, only I, will issue from your walls, guide or companion, friends, I ask ye none, and bow before the murderer of my son. My grief, perhaps, his pity may engage. Perhaps, at least, he may respect my age." He has a father, too, a man like me, one not exempt from age and misery, vigorous no more, as when his young embrace begot this pest of me and all my race. How many valiant sons in early bloom has that cursed hand sent headlong to the tomb, thee, Hector, last? Thy loss, divinely brave, sinks my sad soul with sorrow to the grave. Oh, had thy gentle spirit passed in peace, the sun expiring in the sire's embrace, while both thy parents wept the fatal hour, and bending o'er thee mixed the tender shower, some comfort that had been, some sad relief, to melt in full satiety of grief. Thus wailed the father, groveling on the ground, and all the eyes of Ilion streamed around. Amidst her matrons Hecuba appears, a mourning princess, and a train in tears. Oh, why has heaven prolonged this hated breath, patient of horrors to behold thy death, O Hector, late thy parents' pride and joy, the boast of nations, the defence of Troy, to whom her safety and her fame she owed, her chief, her hero, and almost her god. O fatal change, become in one sad day a senseless coarse, inanimated clay. 
but not as yet the fatal news had spread to fair under Marquis of Hector dead. As yet no messenger had told his fate, not e'en his stay without the Scaean gate. Far in the close recesses of the dome, pensive she plied the melancholy loom. A growing work employed her secret hours, confusedly gay with intermingled flowers. Her fair-haired handmaidens beat the brazen urn, the bath preparing for her lord's return in vain. Alas, her lord returns no more. Unbathed he lies and bleeds along the shore. Now from the walls the clamours reach her ear, and all her members shake with sudden fear. Forth from her ivory hand the shuttle falls, and thus astonished to her maid she calls. Oh, follow me! she cried. What plaintive noise invades my ear? Tis sure my mother's voice, my faltering knees, their trembling frame desert. A pulse unusual flutters at my heart. Some strange disaster, some reverse of fate. Ye gods, avert it, threatens the Trojan state. For be the omen which my thoughts suggest. But much I fear my Hector's dauntless breast confronts Achilles, chased along the plain, shut from our walls. I fear, I fear him slain. Safe in the crowd he ever scorned to wait, and sought for glory in the jaws of fate. Perhaps that noble heat has cost his breath, now quenched forever in the arms of death. She spoke, and furious, with distracted pace, fears in her heart and anguish in her face, flies through the dome, the maids her steps pursue, and mounts the walls and sends around her view, too soon her eyes the killing object found, the godlike Hector dragged along the ground, a sudden darkness shades her swimming eyes, she faints, she falls, her breath, her colour flies, her hair's fair ornaments, the braids that bound, the net that held them, and the wreath that crowned, the veil and diadem, flew far away, the gift of Venus on her bridal day. Around a train of weeping sisters stands, to raise her sinking with assistant hands. Scarce from the verge of death recalled again she faints, or but recovers to complain. O oh, wretched husband of a wretched wife, born with one fate to one unhappy life, for sure one star its baneful beam displayed, on Priam's roof and Hippoplasia's shade, from different parents, different climes we came, at different periods, yet our fate the same. Why was my birth to great Aetion owed, and why was all that tender care bestowed? Would I had never been, O oh, thou, the ghost of my dead husband, miserably lost, thou to the dismal realms forever gone, and I, abandoned, desolate, alone, an only child, once comfort of my pains, sad product now of hapless love remains, no more to smile upon his sire, no friend to help him now, no father to defend. For should he scape the sword, the common doom, what wrongs attend him, and what griefs to come, even from his own paternal roof expelled? Some stranger ploughs his patrimonial field, the day that to the shades the father sends, robs the sad orphan of his father's friends, he, wretched outcast of mankind, appears forever sad, forever bathed in tears. Amongst the happy unregarded he hangs on the robe, or trembles at the knee, while those his father's former bounty fed, nor reach the goblet, nor divide the bread, the kindest, but his present, once a lay, to leave him wretched the succeeding day, frugal compassion, heedless they who boast, both parents still, nor fear what he has lost, shall cry, Be gone, thy father feasts not here. The wretch obeys, retiring with a tear, thus wretched, thus retiring, all in tears. To my sad soul, as the annex appears, forced by repeated insults to return, and to his widowed mother vainly mourn, he, who with tender delicacy bred, with princes sported and on dainties fed, and when, still evening, gave him up to rest, sunk soft and down upon the nurse's breast, must, oh, what must he not, whom Ilion calls Astyanax, from her well-guarded walls, is now that name no more, unhappy boy, since now no more thy father guards his Troy, but thou, my Hector, liest exposed in air, far from thy parents and thy consort's care, whose hand in vain directed by her love the martial scarf and robe of triumph wove, now to devouring flames be these a prey, useless to thee from this accursed day, yet let the sacrifice at least be paid, and honour to the living, not the dead. So spake the mournful dame, her matrons hear, shy back her sighs, and answer tear with tear. The end of Book 22 of the Iliad by Homer. Translated by Alexander Pope. Read by Rick Kistner for Lit to Go on the Web at fcit.usf.edu. The Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope. Book 23. Argument. Funeral Games in Honor of Patroclus. Achilles and the Myrmidons do honors to the body of Patroclus. 
After the funeral feast, he retires to the seashore, where, falling asleep, the ghost of his friend appears to him and demands the rites of burial. The next morning, the soldiers are sent with mules and wagons to fetch wood for the pyre, the funeral possession, and the offering their hair to the dead. Achilles sacrifices several animals and, lastly, twelve Trojan captives at the pile, then sets fire to it. He pays libations to the winds, which at the instance of Iris rise and raise the flames. When the pile has burned all night, they gather the bones, place them in an urn of gold, and raise the tomb. Achilles institutes the funeral games, the chariot race, the fight of the castus, the wrestling, the foot race, the single combat, the discus, the shooting with arrows, the darting, the javelin, the various descriptions of which and the various success of the several antagonists make the greatest part of the book. In this book ends the thirtieth day, the night following the ghosts of Patroclus appears to Achilles. The one and thirtieth day is employed in felling the timber for the pile, the two and thirtieth in burning it, and the three and thirtieth in the games. The scene is generally on the seashore. Thus humbled in the dust, the pensive train, through the sad city, mourned her hero slain. The body, soiled with dust and black with gore, lies on broad Hellespont's resounding shore. The Grecians seek their ships and clear the strand, all but the martial Myrmidonian band. These yet assembled great Achilles holds, and the stern purpose of his mind unfolds. Not yet, my brave companions of the war, release your smoking courses from the car, but with his chariot, each in order led, perform due honours to Patroclus dead. Ere yet from rest or food we seek relief, some rites remain to glut our rage of grief. The troops obeyed, and thrice in order led, Achilles first, their courses round the dead, and thrice their sorrows and laments renew. Tears bathe their arms, and tears the sands bedew. For such a warrior, Thetis aids their woe, melts their strong hearts, and bids their eyes to flow. But chief, Pelides, thick succeeding sighs burst from his heart, and torrents from his eyes. His slaughtering hands, yet red with blood, he laid on his dead friend's cold breast, and thus he said, All hail, Patroclus, let thy honoured ghost hear and rejoice on Pluto's dreary coast. Behold, Achilles' promise is complete, the bloody Hector stretched before thy feet. Lo, to the dogs his carcass I resign." and twelve sad victims of the Trojan line, sacred to vengeance, instant shall expire, their lives effused around thy funeral pyre. Gloomy, he said, and horrible to view, before the bier the bleeding Hector threw, prone on the dust, the Myrmidons around unbrace their armour, and the steeds unbound, all to Achilles' sable ship repair, frequent and full the genial feast to share. Now from the well-fed swine black smokes aspire, the bristly victims hissing o'er the fire, the huge ox bellowing falls with feebler cries, expires the goat, the sheep in silence dies. Around the hero's prostrate body flowed in one promiscuous stream the reeking blood, and now a band of Argive monarchs brings the glorious victor to the king of kings. From his dead friend the pensive warrior went, with steps unwilling to the regal tent. The attending heralds, as by office bound with kindled flames, the tripod vase surround, to cleanse his conquering hands from hostile gore, they urged in vain. The chief refused, and swore. No drop shall touch me by almighty Jove, the first and greatest of the gods above, till on the pyre I place thee, till I rear the grassy mound and clip thy sacred hair. Some ease at least those pious rites may give, and soothe my sorrows while I bear to live." Howe'er reluctant as I am, I stay, and share your feast. But with the dawn of day, O king of men, it claims thy royal care, that Greece the warrior's funeral pile prepare, and bid the forests fall. Such rites are paid to heroes slumbering in eternal shade. Then, when his earthly part shall mount in fire, let the leagued squadrons to their posts retire. He spoke. They hear him, and the word obey. The rage of hunger and of thirst allay. Then ease in sleep the labours of the day. But great Pelides, stretched along the shore, where, dashed on rocks, the broken billows roar, lies inly groaning, while on either hand the martial Myrmidons confusedly stand. Along the grass his languid members fall, tired with his chase around the Trojan wall, hushed by the murmurs of the rolling deep. At length he sinks in the soft arms of sleep. When, lo, 
the shade before his closing eyes of sad Patroclus rose or seemed to rise. In the same robe he living wore, he came. In stature, voice, and pleasing look, the same. The form familiar hovered o'er his head. "'And sleep, Achilles?' thus the phantom said. "'Sleeps my Achilles, his Patroclus dead? Living, I seemed his dearest, tenderest care, but now forgot I wander in the air. Let my pale course the rites of burial know, and give me entrance in the realms below. Till then the spirit finds no resting place, but here and there the unbodied spectres chase the vagrant dead around the dark abode, forbid to cross the irremeable flood. Now give thy hand, for to the farther shore, when once we pass, the soul returns no more. When once the last funereal flames ascend, no more shall meet Achilles and his friend, no more our thoughts to those we loved make known, or quit the dearest to converse alone. Me fate has severed from the sons of earth, the fate foredoomed that waited from my birth. Thee too it waits before the Trojan wall, even great and godlike thou art doomed to fall. Here then, and as in fate and love we join, I'll suffer that my bones may rest with thine. Together have we lived, together bred, one house received us, and one table fed. That golden urn thy goddess mother gave may mix our ashes in one common grave. And is it thou? he answers, to my sight, once more returnest thou from the realms of night? O oh, more than brother, think each office paid, whate'er can rest a discontented shade, but grant one last embrace, unhappy boy. Afford at least that melancholy joy, he said and with his longing arms essayed in vain to grasp the visionary shade. Like a thin smoke he sees the spirit fly, and hears a feeble, lamentable cry. Confused he wakes, amazement breaks the bands of golden sleep, and starting from the sands, pensive, he muses with uplifted hands. "'Tis true, tis certain. Man, though dead, retains part of himself. The immortal mind remains. The form subsists without the body's aid. Ariel, semblance, and an empty shade— this night my friend, so late in battle lost, stood at my side, a pensive, plaintive ghost. Even now, familiar as in life, he came. Alas! How different, yet how like the same! Thus while he spoke, each eye grew big with tears, and now the rosy-fingered morn appears, shows every mournful face with tears all spread, and glares on the pale visage of the dead. But Agamemnon, as the rites demand, with mules and wagons, sends a chosen band to load the timber and the pile to rear, a charge consigned to Marion's faithful care. With proper instruments they take the road, axes to cut and ropes to sling the load. First march the heavy mules, securely slow, o'er hills, o'er dales, o'er crags, o'er rocks they go, jumping high o'er the shrubs of the rough ground, rattle the clattering cars and the shocked axles bound, but when arrived at Ida's spreading woods, fair Ida, watered with descending floods, Loud sounds the axe, redoubling strokes on strokes, on all sides round the forest hurls her oaks headlong, deep echoing groan the thickets brown, then rustling, crackling, crashing thunder down. The wood the Grecians cleave, prepared to burn, and the slow mules the same rough road return, the sturdy woodman equal burdens bore, such charge was given them to the sandy shore. There on the spot which great Achilles showed, they eased their shoulders and disposed the load. Circling around the place where times to come shall view Patroclus and Achilles' tomb, the hero bids his martial troops appear high on their cars in all the pomp of war. Each in refulgent arms his limbs attires, all mount their chariots, combatants, and squires. The chariots first proceed a shining train, then clouds of foot that smoke along the plain. Next these the melancholy band appear, amidst lay dead Patroclus on the bier. O'er all the course their scattered locks they throw, Achilles next, oppressed with mighty woe, Supporting with his hands the hero's head, Bends o'er the extended body of the dead. Patroclus descent on the appointed ground, They place and heap the sylvan pile around, But great Achilles stands apart in prayer, And from his head divides the yellow hair. Those curling locks which from his youth he vowed, And sacred grew to Spercius' honoured flood, Then sighing to the deep, his locks he cast, and rolled his eyes around the watery waste. Spercius, 
whose waves in mazy errors lost delightful roll along my native coast, to whom we vainly vowed at our return these locks to fall and hecatombs to burn, full fifty rams to bleed in sacrifice, where to the day thy silver fountains rise, and where in shade of consecrated bowers thy altars stand, perfumed with native flowers. So vowed my father, but he vowed in vain. No more Achilles sees his native plain. In that vain hope these hairs no longer grow. Patroclus bears them to the shades below. Thus, or Patroclus, while the hero prayed on his cold hand, the sacred lock he laid. Once more afresh the Grecian sorrows flow, and now the sun had set upon their woe. But to the king of men thus spoke the chief, Enough, Atrides, give the troops relief. Permit the mourning legions to retire, and let the chiefs alone attend the pyre. The pious care be ours, the dead to burn, he said. The people to their ships return, while those deputed to inter the slain heap with the rising pyramid the plain. A hundred foot in length, a hundred wide, the growing structure spreads on every side. High on the top the manly course they lay, and well-fed sheep and sable oxen slay. Achilles covered with their fat the dead, and the piled victims round the body spread. Then jars of honey and of fragrant oil suspends around, low-bending o'er the pile. Four sprightly courses with a deadly groan pour forth their lives, and on the pyre are thrown. Of nine large dogs domestic at his board fall two selected to attend their lord. Then last of all, and horrible to tell, sad sacrifice, twelve Trojan captives fell. On these the rage of fire victorious praise involves and joins them in one common blaze. Smeared with the bloody rites, he stands on high, and calls the spirit with a dreadful cry. All hail, Patroclus! Let thy vengeful ghost hear and exult on Pluto's dreary coast. Behold Achilles' promise fully paid, twelve Trojan heroes offered to thy shade. But heavier fates on Hector's course attend, saved from the flames for hungry dogs to rend. So spake he, threatening, but the gods made vain his threat, and guard inviolate the slain. Celestial Venus hovered o'er his head, and roseate, unguents, heavenly fragrance shed. She watched him all the night and all the day, and drove the bloodhounds from their destined prey. Nor sacred Phoebus less employed his care. He poured around a veil of gathered air, and kept the nerves undried, the flesh entire, against the solar beam and Syrian fire. Nor yet the pile where dead Patroclus lies, smokes, nor as yet the sullen flames arise. But fast beside, Achilles stood in prayer, invoked the gods whose spirit moves the air, and victims promised and libations cast to gentle Zephyr and the boreal blast. He called the aerial powers along the skies to breathe and whisper to the fires to rise. The winged iris heard the hero's call and instant hastened to their airy hall, where, in old Zephyr's open courts on high, sat all the blustering brethren of the sky. She shone amidst them on her painted bow, the rocky pavement glittered with the show. All from the banquet rise, and each invites the various goddess to partake the rites. Not so, the dame replied, I haste to go to sacred ocean, and the floods below. Even now our solemn hecatombs attend, and heaven is feasting on the world's green end, with righteous Ethiop's uncorrupted train, far on the extremest limits of the main." But Peleus' son entreats with sacrifice the western spirit and the north to rise. Let on Patroclus' pile your blast be driven, and bear the blazing honours high to heaven. Swift as the word she vanished from their view, swift as the word the winds tumultuous blew. Forth burst the stormy band with thundering roar, and heaps on heaps the clouds are tossed before. To the wide main then stooping from the skies the heaving deeps and watery mountains rise. Troy feels the blast along her shaking walls, till on the pile the gathered tempest falls. The structure crackles in the roaring fires, and all the night the plenteous flames aspires. All night Achilles hails Patroclus' soul with large libations from the golden bowl. As a poor father, helpless and undone, mourns o'er the ashes of an only son, takes a sad pleasure the last bones to burn, and pours in tears ere yet they close the urn, so stayed Achilles circling round the shore. So watched the flames, till now they flame no more. T'was when emerging through the shades of night the morning planet told the approach of light, and fast behind Aurora's warm array o'er the broad ocean poured the golden day. Then sank the blaze, the pile no longer burned, 
and to their caves the whistling winds returned. Across the Thracian seas their course they bore, the ruffled seas beneath their passage roar. Then, parting from the pile, he ceased to weep, and sank to quiet in the embrace of sleep, exhausted with his grief. Meanwhile the crowd of thronging Grecians round Achilles stood. The tumult waked him from his eyes. He shook unwilling slumber, and the chiefs bespoke, Ye kings and princes of the Achaean name, first let us quench the yet remaining flame. With sable wine, then, as the rites direct, the hero's bones with careful view select. Apart, and easy to be known, they lie amidst the heap, and obvious to the eye. The rest around the margin will be seen, promiscuous steeds and immolated men. These, wrapped in double coils of fat, prepare, and in the golden vase dispose with care. There let them rest, with decent honour laid, till I shall follow to the infernal shade. Meanwhile, erect the tomb with pious hands, a common structure on the humble sands. Hereafter, Greece, some nobler work may raise, and late posterity record our praise. The Greeks obey, where yet the embers glow, wide o'er the pile the sable wine they throw, and deep subsides the ashy heap below. Next, the white bones his sad companions place with tears collected in the golden vase. The sacred relics to the tent they bore, the urn a veil of linen covered o'er, that done, they bid the sepulchre aspire, and cast the deep foundations round the pyre. High in the midst they heap the swelling bed of rising earth, memorial of the dead. The swarming populace the chief detains, and leads amidst a wide extent of plains. There placed them round, then from the ships proceeds a train of oxen, mules, and stately steeds, vases and tripods for the funeral games, resplendent brass and more resplendent dames. First stood the prizes, to reward the force of rapid races in the dusty course. A woman for the first, in beauty's bloom, skilled in the needle and the labouring loom, and a large vase where two bright handles rise of twenty measures its capacious size. The second victor claims a mare unbroke, big, with a mule unknowing of the yoke. The third a charger yet untouched by flame, four ample measures held the shining frame. Two golden talons for the fourth were placed, and ample double bowl contents the last. These in fair order ranged upon the plain, the hero rising thus addressed the train. Behold the prize as valiant Greeks, decreed to the brave rulers of the racing steed, prizes which none beside ourself could gain, should our immortal coursers take the plain. A race unrivaled, which from ocean's god Peleus received, and on his son bestowed. But this no time our vigour to display, nor suit with them the games of this sad day. Lost is Patroclus now, that want to deck their flowing manes, and sleek their glossy neck, sad as they shared in human grief they stand, and trail those graceful honours on the sand. Let others for the noble task prepare, who trust the courser and the flying car. Fired at his word, the rival racers rise, but far the first Eumelus hopes the prize, famed through Pieria for the fleetest breed, and skilled to manage the high-bounding steed, with equal ardour, bold Tydides swelled, the steeds of Thros beneath his yoke compelled, which late obeyed the Dardan chief's command, when scarce a god redeemed him from his hand. Then Menelaus his Podargus brings, and the famed courser of the king of kings, whom rich Echepolis, more rich than brave, to escape the wars to Agamemnon gave, Aethi, her name, at home to end his days, base wealth preferring to eternal praise. Next him Antilochus demands the course with beating heart, and cheers his Pylian horse. Experienced Nestor gives his son the reins, directs his judgment, and his heat restrains, nor idly warns the Horace higher, nor hears the prudent son with unattending ears. My son, though youthful ardour fire thy breast, the gods have loved thee, and with arts have blessed. Neptune and Jove on thee conferred the skill, swift round the goal to turn the flying wheel. To guide thy conduct little precept needs, but slow, and past their vigour are my steeds. Fear not thy rivals, though for swiftness known, compare those rivals' judgment and thy own. It is not strength, but art obtains the prize, and to be swift is less than to be wise. Tis more by art than force of numerous strokes the dexterous woodman shapes the stubborn oaks. By art the pilot, through the boiling deep, and howling tempest steers the fearless ship, and tis the artist wins the glorious course. Not those who trust in chariots and in horse. In vain 
unskilful to the goal they strive, and short or wide the ungoverned course or drive, while with sure skill, though with inferior steeds, the knowing racer to his end proceeds. Fixed on the goal his eye foreruns the course, his hand unerring steers the steady horse, and now contracts or now extends the rein, observing still the foremost on the plain. Mark then the goal, tis easy to be found, yon aged trunk, a cubit from the ground. Of some once stately oak the last remains, or hardy fir, unperished with the rains, enclosed with stones conspicuous from afar, and round a circle for the wheeling car, some tomb, perhaps, of old, the dead to grace, or then is now the limit of a race. Bear close to this, and warily proceed a little bending to the left-hand steed, but urge the right and give him all the reins, while the strict hand his fellow's head restrains, and turns him short, till, doubling as they roll, the wheel's round knaves appear to brush the goal, yet not to break the car or lame the horse, clear of the stony heap direct the course, lest, through incaution failing, thou mayest be a joy to others, a reproach to me. So shalt thou pass the goal secure of mind, and leave unskilful swiftness far behind. Though thy fierce rival drove the matchless steed which bore Adrastus of celestial breed, or the famed race through all the regions known that whirled the car of proud Laomedon. Thus, not unsaid, the much advising sage concludes, then sat stiff with unwieldy age. Next, bold Marionus was seen to rise, the last but not least ardent for the prize. They mount their seats, the lots their place dispose, rolled in his helmet these Achilles throws. Young Nestor leads the race, Eumelus then, and next the brother of the king of men. Thy lot Marionus the fourth was cast, and far the bravest Diomed was last. They stand in order, an impatient train. Pelides points the barrier on the plain, and sends before old Phoenix to the place to mark the races and to judge the race. At once the courses from the barrier bound, the lifted scourges all at once resound, their heart, their eyes, their voice they send before, and up the champagne thunder from the shore. Thick where they drive, the dusty clouds arise, and the lost courser in the whirlwind flies. Loose on their shoulders the long manes recline, float in their speed and dance upon the wind. The smoking chariots, rapid as they bound, now seem to touch the sky, and now the ground. While hot for fame and conquest, all their care, each or his flying courser hung in air, erect with ardor, poised upon the rein, they pant, they stretch, they shout along the plain. Now the last compass fetched round the goal, at the near prize each gathers all his soul, each burns with double hope, with double pain, tears up the shore and thunders towards the main. First few, Eumelus on Pharisian steeds, with those of Tros, bold Diomed succeeds. Close on Eumelus' back they puff the wind, and seem just mounting on his car behind. Full on his neck he feels the sultry breeze, and hovering o'er, their stretching shadows seize. Then, had he lost or left a doubtful prize, but angry Phoebus to Tydides flies, strikes from his hand the scourge, and renders vain his matchless horse's labour on the plain. Rage fills his eye with anguish to survey, snatched from his hope the glories of the day. The fraud celestial palace, seized with pain, springs to a knight, and gives the scourge again, and fills his steeds with vigour. At a stroke she breaks his rival's chariot from the yoke. No more their way the startled horses held, the car reversed came rattling on the field, shot headlong from his seat, beside the wheel prone on the dust the unhappy master fell, his battered face and elbows strike the ground, nose, mouth, and front, one undistinguished wound. Grief stops his voice, a torrent drowns his eyes, before him far the glad Tydides flies, Minerva's spirit drives his matchless pace, and crowns him victor of the laboured race. The next, though distant, Menelaus succeeds, while thus young Nestor animates his steeds. Now, now, my generous pair, exert your force, not that we hope to match Tydides' horse, since great Minerva wings their rapid way, and gives their lord the honours of the day. But reach Atrides, shall his mare outgo your swiftness, vanquished by a female foe? Through your neglect, if lagging on the plain, the last ignoble gift be all we gain. No more shall Nestor's hand your food supply, the old man's fury rises, and ye die. Haste, then, yon narrow road before our sight presents the occasion, could we use it right. Thus he. The courses at their master's threat, with quicker steps, the sounding champagne beat, and now Antilochus, with nice survey, observes the compass of the hollow way. T'was where, by force of wintry torrents torn, fast by the road a precipice was worn, here, where but one could pass to shun the throng, the Spartan hero's chariots smoked along. 
Close up the venturous youth resolves to keep, still edging near, and bears him toward the steep. Atrides, trembling, casts his eye below, and wonders at the rashness of his foe. Hold! Stay your steeds! What madness thus to ride this narrow way! Take larger field! he cried, or both must fall, Atrides cried in vain. He flies more fast, and throws up all the rain, far as an able arm the disc can send, when youthful rivals their full force extend. So far, Antilochus! Thy chariot flew before the king, he cautious backward drew his horse, compelled, foreboding in his fears, the rattling ruin of the clashing cars, the floundering courses rolling on the plain, and conquest lost through frantic haste to gain. But thus upbraids his rival as he flies, Go, furious youth, ungenerous and unwise, go, but expect not, I'll the prize resign, add perjury to fraud, and make it thine. Then to his steeds with all his force he cries, Be swift, be vigorous, and regain the prize. Your rivals, destitute of youthful force, with fainting knees shall labor in the course, and yield the glory yours. The steeds obey. Already at their heels they wing their way, and seem already to retrieve the day. Meantime, the Grecians in a ring beheld the courses bounding o'er the dusty field. The first who marked them was the Cretan king. High, on a rising ground above the ring, the monarch sat from whence, with sure survey, he well observed the chief who led the way, and heard from far his animating cries, and saw the foremost steed with sharpened eyes, on whose broad front a blaze of shining white like the full moon stood obvious to the sight. He saw, and rising to the Greeks begun, Are yonder horse discerned by me alone, or can ye all another chief survey, and other steeds than lately led the way? Those, though the swiftest, by some god withheld, lie sure disabled in the middle field, for since the goal they doubled round the plain I searched to find them, but I search in vain. Perchance the reins forsook the driver's hand, and turned too short he tumbled on the strand, shot from the chariot while his coursers stray with frantic fury from the destined way. Rise, then, some other, and inform my sight, for these dim eyes perhaps discern not right. Yet sure he seems, to judge by shape and air, the great Aetolian chief, renowned in war." "'Old man,' Oleus rashly thus replies, "'thy tongue too hastily confers the prize. "'Of those who view the course, nor sharpest-eyed, nor youngest, "'yet the readiest to decide, "'humilous steeds, high-bounding in the chase, "'still, as at first unrivaled, lead the race. "'I well discern him as he shakes the rein, "'and hear his shouts victorious o'er the plain. "'Thus he. "'Idomeneus, incensed, rejoined, "'barbarous of words and arrogant of mind,' contentious prince, of all the Greeks beside, the last in merit is the first in pride. To vile reproach, what answer can we make? A goblet or a tripod let us stake, and be the king the judge. The most unwise will learn their rashness when they pay the price, he said. And Ajax, by mad passion born, stern had replied, fierce scorn, enhancing scorn, to fell extremes. But Thetis, godlike son, awful, amidst them rose, and thus begun. Forbear, ye chiefs, reproachful to contend, Much would ye blame, should others thus offend, and, lo, the approaching steeds your contest end. No sooner had he spoke, but thundering near, drives through a stream of dust the charioteer, high o'er his head the circling lash he wields, his bounding horses scarcely touch the fields, his car amidst the dusty whirlwind rolled, bright with the mingled blaze of tin and gold, refulgent through the cloud, no eye could find the track his flying wheels had left behind and the fierce coursers urged their rapid pace, so swift it seemed a flight and not a race. Now victor at the gold tidity stands, quits his bright car, and springs upon the sands. From the hot steeds the sweaty torrents stream, the well-plied whip is hung athwart the beam. With joy brave Sthenelus receives the prize, the tripod vase and dame with radiant eyes. These to the ships, his train triumphant leads, the chief himself unyokes the panting steeds. Young Nestor follows, who by art, not force, or past Atrides, second in the course. Behind, Atrides urged the race, more near than to the courser in his swift career, the following car, just touching with his heel, and brushing with his tail the whirling wheel. Such and so narrow now the space between the rivals late so distant on the green, so soon swift, Athe her lost ground regained, one length, one moment, had the race obtained. Marion pursued at greater distance still, with tardier courses and inferior skill, Last came Admetus, thy unhappy son, slow dragged the steeds his battered chariot on, Achilles saw, and pitying thus begun. Behold the man whose matchless art surpassed the sons of Greece, 
the ablest, yet the last. Fortune denies, but justice bids us pay, since great Tydides bears the first away, to him the second honours of the day. The Greeks consent with loud applauding cries, and then Eumelus had received the prize. But youthful Nestor, jealous of his fame, the award opposes and asserts his claim. Think not, he cries, I tamely will resign, O Pelis' son, the mare so justly mine. What if the gods, the skilful to confound, have thrown the horse and horseman to the ground? Perhaps he sought not heaven by sacrifice, and vows omitted forfeited the prize. If yet, distinction to thy friend to show, and please a soul desirous to bestow, some gift must grace Eumelus, view thy store of beauteous handmaids, steeds, and shining ore. An ample present let him thence receive, and Greece shall praise thy generous thirst to give, but this my prize I never shall forego, this who but touches warriors is my foe. Thus spake the youth, nor did his words offend, pleased with the well-turned flattery of a friend, Achilles smiled. The gift proposed, he cried, Antilochus, we shall ourselves provide. With plates of brass the corslet covered o'er, the same renown Asteropius wore, whose glittering margins raised with silver shine, no vulgar gift, Eumelus, shall be thine. He said, Automedon, at his command, the corslet brought, and gave it to his hand, distinguished by his friend, his bosom glows, with generous joy. Then Menelaus rose. The herald placed the sceptre in his hands, and stilled the clamour of the shouting bands. Not without cause incensed at Nestor's son, and inly grieving, thus the king begun. The praise of wisdom in thy youth obtained an act so rash, Antilochus, has stained. Robbed of my glory and my just reward to you, O Grecians, be my wrong declared. Not so a leader shall our conduct blame, or judge me envious of a rival's fame. But shall not we ourselves the truth maintain? What needs appealing in a fact so plain? What Greek shall blame me if I bid thee rise, and vindicate by oath till the ill-gotten prize? Rise, if thou darest, before thy chariot stand, the driving scourge high lifted in thy hand, and touch thy steeds, and swear thy whole intent was but to conquer, not to circumvent. Swear by that God whose liquid arms surround the globe, and whose dread earthquakes heave the ground. The prudent chief with calm attention heard, then, mildly thus, Excuse if youth have erred. Superior as thou art, forgive the offence, nor I thy equal, or in years or sense. Thou knowest the errors of unripened age, weak are its counsels, headlong is its rage. The prize I quit, if thou thy wrath resign, the mare, or aught thou askest, be freely thine, ere I become, from thy friendship dear, torn, hateful to thee, and to the gods forsworn. So spoke Antilochus, and at the word the mare contested to the king restored. Joy swells his soul as when the vernal grain lifts the green ear above the springing plain. The fields the vegetable life renew, and laugh and glitter with the morning dew. Such joy the Spartan's shining face all spread, and lifted his gay heart while thus he said, Still may our souls, O generous youth, agree, tis now Atreides' turn to yield to thee. Rash heat perhaps a moment might control, not break the settled temper of thy soul, not but, my friend, tis still the wiser way to waive contention with superior sway, for, ah, how few, who should, like thee, offend, like thee, have talents to regain the friend. To plead indulgence, and thy fault atone, suffice thy father's merit and thy own, generous alike for me, the sire, and son, have greatly suffered, and have greatly done. I yield, that all may know my soul can bend, nor is my pride preferred before my friend. He said, and pleased his passion to command, resigned the courser to no man's hand. Friend of the youthful chief, himself content, the shining charger to his vessel sent, the golden talents Marion next obtained, the fifth reward the double bowl remained, Achilles this to reverend Nestor bears, and thus the purpose of his gift declares, Accept thou this, O sacred sire, he said, in dear memorial of Patroclus dead. Dead, and forever lost Patroclus lies, forever snatched from our desiring eyes. Take thou this token of a grateful heart, though tis not thine to hurl the distant dart, the quoit to toss the ponderous mace to wield, or urge the race or wrestle on the field, thy pristine vigour age has overthrown, but left the glory of the past thy own, he said, and placed the goblet at his side, 
With joy the venerable king replied, Wisely and well, my son, thy words have proved, a senior honoured and a friend beloved. Too true it is, deserted of my strength, these withered arms and limbs have failed at length. Oh, had I now that force I felt of your known through Buprasim and the Pylian shore, victorious then in every solemn game, ordained to Amarence's mighty name, the brave Epeans gave my glory way, Atolians, Pylians, all resigned the day, I quelled Clitomides in fights of hand, and backward hurled Ancaeus on the sand, surpassed Iphiclus in the swift career, Phileus and Polydorus with the spear. The sons of Actor won the prize of horse, but won by numbers, not by art or force. For the famed twins, impatient to survey prize after prize by Nestor borne away, sprung to their car, and with united pains one lashed the courses, while one ruled the reins. Such once I was. Now to these tasks succeeds a younger race that emulate our deeds. I yield, alas, to age, who must not yield, though once the foremost hero of the field— Go thou, my son, by generous friendship led, with martial honours decorate the dead, while pleased I take the gift thy hands present, pledge of benevolence and kind intent, rejoiced of all the numerous Greeks to see not one but honours sacred age in me, those due distinctions thou so well canst pay, may the just gods return another day. Proud of the gift, thus spake the fool of days, Achilles heard him, prouder of the praise, the prizes next are ordered to the field, for the bold champions who the Caestus wield, a stately mule as yet by toils unbroke, of six years' age unconscious of the yoke, is to the circus led and firmly bound. Next stands a goblet, massy, large and round. Achilles rising thus, let Greece excite two heroes equal to this hardy fight, who dare the foe with lifted arms provoke, and rush beneath the long descending stroke, on whom Apollo shall the palm bestow, and whom the Greeks supreme by conquest know, this mule his dauntless labour shall repay, the vanquished bear the massy bowl away. This dreadful combat great Apeus chose, high o'er the crowd enormous bulk he rose, and seized the beast, and thus began to say, Stand forth some man to bear the bowl away. Price of his ruin, for who dares deny, this mule my right, the undoubted victor I. Others tis owned in fields of battle shine, but the first honours of this fight are mine, for who excels in all? Then let my foe draw near, but first his certain fortune know, secure this hand shall his whole frame confound, mash all his bones and all his body pound, so let his friends be nigh a needful train to heave the battered carcass off the plain. The giant spoke, and, in a stupid gaze, the host beheld him silent with amaze. "'Twas thou, Euryalus, who durst aspire to meet his might and emulate thy sire, the great Mesistheus, who in days of yore in Theban games the noblest trophy bore, the games ordained dead Oedipus to grace, and singly vanquished the Cadmian race. Him great Tydides urges to contend, warm with the hopes of conquest for his friend. Officious with the cincture girds him round, and to his wrist the gloves of death are bound. Amid the circle now, each champion stands, and poises high in air his iron hands. With clashing gauntlets now they fiercely close, their crackling jaws re-echo to the blows, and painful sweat from all their members flows. At length Apeus dealt a weighty blow, full on the cheek of his unwary foe. Beneath that ponderous arm's resistless sway down dropped he, nerveless and extended lay. As a large fish, when winds and waters roar by some huge billow dashed against the shore, lies panting, not less battered with his wound. The bleeding hero pants upon the ground. To rear his fallen foe, the victor lends, scornful, his hand, and gives him to his friends, whose arms support him, reeling through the throng, and dragging his disabled legs along. Nodding his head, hangs down, his shoulder o'er, his mouth and nostrils pour the clotted gore. Wrapped round in mists he lies, and lost to thought, his friends receive the bowl too dearly bought. The third bold game Achilles next demands, and calls the wrestlers to the level sands. A massy tripod for the victor lies, of twice six oxen its reputed price, and next the loser's spirits to restore, a female captive valued but at four. Scarce did the chief the vigorous strife prop when tower-like Ajax and Ulysses rose. Amid the ring each nervous rival stands, embracing rigid with implicit hands. Close locked above, 
their heads and arms are mixed, below their planted feet at distance fixed, like two strong rafters which the builder forms, proof to the wintry winds and howling storms, their tops connected but at wider space, fixed on the centre stands their solid base, now to the grasp each manly body bends, the humid sweat from every pore descends, their bones resound with blows, sides, shoulders, thighs swell to each grip, and bloody tumours rise, nor could Ulysses for his art renowned or turn the strength of Ajax on the ground, nor could the strength of Ajax overthrow the watchful caution of his artful foe. While this long strife even tired the lookers-on, thus to Ulysses spoke great Telamon, or let me lift thee, chief, or lift thou me, prove we our force, and Jove the rest decree, he said, and straining, heaved him off the ground with matchless strength. That time Ulysses found the strength to evade, and where the nerves combine, his ankle struck, the giant fell supine, Ulysses following on his bosom lies. Shouts of applause run rattling through the skies, Ajax, to lift Ulysses, next essays. He barely stirred him, but he could not raise, his knee locked fast, the foe's attempt denied, and grappling close they tumbled side by side. Defiled with honourable dust they roll, still breathing strife and unsubdued of soul. Again they rage, again to combat rise, when great Achilles thus divides the prize. Your noble vigour, O my friends, restrain, nor weary out your generous strength in vain. Ye both have won. Let others who excel now prove that prowess you have proved so well. The hero's words the willing chiefs obey, from their tired bodies wipe the dust away, and, clothed anew, the following game survey. And now succeed the gifts ordained to grace the youths contending in the rapid race, a silver urn that full six measures held, by none in weight or workmanship excelled. Sidonian artists taught the frame to shine, elaborate with artifice divine, whence Tyrian sailors did the prize transport, and gave to Thoas at the Lemnian port. From him descended good Eunaeus heired the glorious gift, and for Lechaon spared to brave Patroclus gave the rich reward. Now the same hero's funeral rites to grace, it stands the prize of swiftness in the race. A well-fed ox was for the second placed, and half a talent must content the last. Achilles, rising then, bespoke the train, who hope the palm of swiftness to obtain, stand forth, and bear these prizes from the plain." the hero said, and starting from his place, Olean Ajax rises to the race, Ulysses next, and he whose speed surpassed his youthful equals, Nestor's son the last. Ranged in a line, the ready races stand, Pelides points the barrier with his hand, all start at once, Oleus led the race, the next Ulysses measuring pace with pace, behind him diligently close he sped, as closely following as the running thread the spindle follows, and displays the charms of the fair spinster's breast and moving arms. Graceful in motion thus his foe he plies, and treads each footstep ere the dust can rise. His glowing breath upon his shoulders plays, the admiring Greeks loud acclamations raise. To him they give their wishes, hearts, and eyes, and send their souls before him as he flies. Now, three times turned in prospect of the goal, the panting chief to Pallas lifts his soul. Assist, O goddess! Thus in thought he prayed, and present at his thought descends the maid. Buoyed by her heavenly force, he seems to swim, and feels a pinion lifting every limb, all fierce and ready now the prize to gain. Unhappy Ajax stumbles on the plain, or turned by Pallas, where the slippery shore was clogged with slimy dung and mingled gore, the self-same place, besides Patroclus' pyre, where late the slaughtered victims fed the fire. Besmeared with filth and blotted o'er with clay, obscene to sight, the rueful racer lay, the well-fed boar, the second prize he shared, and left the urn Ulysses' rich reward. Then, grasping by the horn the mighty beast, the baffled hero thus the Greeks addressed, a cursed fate, the conquest I forego, a mortal I, a goddess, was my foe. She urged her favourite on the rapid way, and Pallas, not Ulysses, won the day. Thus sourly wailed he, sputtering dirt and gore. A burst of laughter echoed through the shore. Antilochus, more humorous than the rest, takes the last prize and takes it with a jest. Why, with our wiser elders, should we strive? The gods still love them, and they always thrive. Ye see, to Ajax I must yield the prize, he to Ulysses, still more aged and wise, a green old age unconscious of decays, that proves the hero born in better days. Behold his vigour in this active race, Achilles only boasts a swifter pace, for who can match Achilles? He who can must yet be more than hero, more than man. 
The effect succeeds the speech. Pelides cries, Thy artful praise deserves a better prize, nor Greece in vain shall hear thy friend extolled receive a talent of the purest gold. The youth departs content. The host admire the son of Nestor, worthy of his sire. Next these, a buckler, spear, and helm he brings, cast on the plain the brazen burden rings, arms which of late divine Sarpedon wore, and great Patroclus in short triumph bore, stand forth the bravest of our host, he cries. Whoever dares deserve so rich a prize, now grace the lists before our army's sight, and sheathed in steel provoke his foe to fight. Who first the jointed armour shall explore, and stain his rival's mare with issuing gore, the sword Asteropius possessed of old, a Thracian blade distinct with studs of gold, shall pay the stroke and grace the striker's side. These arms in common let the chiefs divide, for each brave champion when the combat ends a sumptuous banquet at our tents attends. Fierce at the word uprose great Tydeus' son, and the huge bulk of Ajax Telamon, clad in refulgent steel on either hand, the dreadful chiefs amid the circle stand, lowering they meet, tremendous to the sight, each argive bosom beats with fierce delight. Opposed in arms, not long they idly stood, but thrice they closed, and thrice the charge renewed. A furious pass the spear of Ajax made through the broad shield, but at the corslet stayed. Not thus the foe, his javelin aimed above the buckler's margin at the neck he drove, but Greece, now trembling for her hero's life, bade share the honours and surcease the strife. Yet still the victors do Tydides gains, with him the sword and studded belt remains. Then hurled the hero, thundering on the ground a mass of iron, an enormous round, whose weight and size the circling Greeks admire, rude from the furnace, and but shaped by fire. This mighty quoit Aeotian wont to rear, and from his whirling arm dismiss in air. The giant by Achilles slain, he stowed among his spoils this memorable load, for this he bids those nervous artists vie, that teach the disc to sound along the sky. Let him, whose might can hurl this bowl, arise, who farthest hurls it, take it as his prize, if he be one enriched with large domain of downs for flocks and arable for grain, small stock of iron needs that man provide, his hinds and swains whole years shall be supplied from hence. Nor ask the neighbouring city's aid for ploughshares, wheels, and all the rural trade." Stern Polypoetus stepped before the throng, and great Leontius, more than mortal strong, whose force with rival forces to oppose, uprose great Ajax, up Epius rose. Each stood in order, first Epius threw, high o'er the wandering crowds the whirling circle flew. Leontius next a little space surpassed, and third the strength of godlike Ajax cast. Or both their marks it flew, till fiercely flung from Polypoetus' arm the discus sung, far as a swain his whirling sheep's hook throws that distant falls among the grazing cows. So past them all the rapid circle flies, his friends, while loud applauses shake the skies, with force conjoined heave off the weighty prize. Those who in skilful archery contend, he next invites the twanging bow to bend, and twice ten axes casts amidst the round, ten double-edged and ten that singly wound the mast, which late a first-rate galley bore. The hero fixes in the sandy shore, to the tall top a milk-white dove they tie, the trembling mark at which their arrows fly. Whose weapon strikes yon fluttering bird shall bear these two-edged axes, terrible in war, the single he whose shaft divides the cord, he said. Experienced Marion took the word, and skilful Teucer. In the helm they threw, their lots inscribed, and forth the latter flew. Swift from the string the sounding arrow flies, but flies unblessed. No grateful sacrifice, no firstling lambs unheedful didst thou vow to Phoebus, patron of the shaft and bow. For this thy well-aimed arrow turned aside, erred from the dove, yet cut the cord that tied. Adown the mainmast fell the parted string, and the free bird to heaven displays her wing. She, shores and skies, with loud applause resound, and Marion eager meditates the wound. He takes the bow, directs the shaft above, and following with his eye the soaring dove implores the god to speed it through the skies, with vows of firstling lambs and grateful sacrifice the dove, in airy circles as she wheels, amid the clouds the piercing arrow feels. Quite through, and through the point its passage found, and at his feet fell bloody to the ground. The wounded bird, ere yet she breathed her last, with flagging wings alighted on the mast, a moment hung, and spread her pinions there, then suddenly dropped, and left her life in air. From the pleased crowd new peals of thunder rise, and to the ship's brave Marion bears the prize. 
To close the funeral games, Achilles last, a masty spear amid the circle placed, an ample charger of unsolid frame, with flowers high wrought, not blackened yet by flame, for these he bids the heroes prove their art, whose dexterous skill directs the flying dart. Here too great Marion hopes the noble prize, nor here disdained the king of men to rise. With joy Pelides saw the honour paid, rose to the monarch, and respectful said, Thee first in virtue, as in power supreme, O king of nations, all thy Greeks proclaim. In every martial game thy worth attest, and know thee both their greatest and their best. Take then the prize, but let brave Marion bear this beamy javelin in thy brother's war. Pleased from the hero's lips his praise to hear, the king to Marion gives the brazen spear. But set apart, for sacred use commands, the glittering charger to Talthibius's hands. The end of Book 23 of the Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope. Read by Rick Kistner for Lit to Go on the Web at fcit.usf.edu. The Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope. Book 24. Argument. The Redemption of the Body of Hector. The gods deliberate about the redemption of Hector's body. Jupiter sends Thetis to Achilles to dispose him for the restoring it, and Iris to Priam to encourage him to go in person and treat for it. The old king, notwithstanding the remonstrances of his queen, makes ready for the journey to which he is encouraged by an omen from Jupiter. He sets forth in his chariot with a wagon loaded with presents under the charge of Ardaeus the herald. Mercury descends in the shape of a young man and conducts him to the pavilion of Achilles. Their conversation on the way... Priam finds Achilles at his table, casts himself at his feet, and begs for the body of his son. Achilles, moved with compassion, grants his request, detains him one night in his tent, and the next morning sends him home with the body. The Trojans run out to meet him, the lamentations of Andromache, Hecuba, and Helen, with the solemnities of the funeral. The time of twelve days is employed in this book, while the body of Hector lies in the tent of Achilles, and as many more are spent in the truce allowed for his interment. The scene is partly in Achilles' camp and partly in Troy. Now from the finished games the Grecian band seek their black ships and clear the crowded strand, all stretched at ease, the genial banquet share, and pleasing slumbers quiet all their care. Not so Achilles, he to grief resigned, his friend's dear image present to his mind, takes his sad couch more unobserved to weep, nor tastes the gifts of all composing sleep. Restless he rolled around his weary bed, and all his soul on his Patroclus fed. The form so pleasing and the heart so kind, that youthful vigour and that manly mind, what toils they shared, what martial works they wrought, what seas they measured and what fields they fought. All passed before him in remembrance dear, thought follows thought, and tear succeeds to tear. And now supine, now prone, the hero lay, now shifts his side, impatient for the day. Then, starting up disconsolate, he goes wide on the lonely beach to vent his woes. There, as the solitary mourner raves, the ruddy morning rises o'er the waves. Soon as it rose, his furious steeds he joined, the chariot flies, and Hector trails behind. And thrice, Patroclus, round thy monument was Hector dragged, then hurried to the tent. There, asleep at last, o'er comes the hero's eyes, while foul in dust the unhonoured carcass lies." but not deserted by the pitying skies, for Phoebus watched it with superior care, preserved from gaping wounds and tainting air, and ignominious as it swept the field, spread o'er the sacred course his golden shield. All heaven was moved, and Hermes willed to go by stealth to snatch him from the insulting foe. But Neptune this, and Pallas this denies, and the unrelenting empress of the skies, ere since that day, implacable to Troy, what time young Paris, simple shepherd boy, won by destructive lust, reward obscene, their charms rejected for the Cyprian queen. But when the tenth celestial morning broke, to heaven assembled, thus Apollo spoke. Unpitying powers, how oft each holy fane has Hector tinged with blood of victim slain, and can ye still his cold remains pursue? Still grudge his body to the Trojans' view, deny to consort, mother, son, and sire the last sad honours of our funeral fire? Is then the dire Achilles all your care? That iron heart inflexibly severe, a lion, not a man, who slaughters wide in strength of rage and impotence of pride, who hastes to murder with a savage joy, invades around, and breathes but to destroy. 
Shame is not of his soul, nor understood, the greatest evil and the greatest good. Still, for one loss he rages unresigned, repugnant to the lot of all mankind. To lose a friend, a, a brother, or a son, heaven dooms each mortal, and its will is done. A while they sorrow, then dismiss their care. Fate gives the wound, and man is born to bear. But this insatiate, the commission given by fate exceeds, and tempts the wrath of heaven. Lo, how his rage dishonest drags along Hector's dead earth, insensible of wrong. Brave though he be, yet by no reason awed he violates the laws of man and God. If equal honours by the partial skies are doomed, both heroes, Juno thus replies, if Thetis' son must no distinction know, then hear ye gods, the patron of the bow, but Hector only boasts a mortal claim, his birth deriving from a mortal dame. Achilles of your own ethereal race springs from a goddess by a man's embrace, a goddess by ourself to Peleus given, a man divine and chosen friend of heaven. To grace those nuptials from the bright abode yourselves were present, where this minstrel god, well pleased to share the feast, amid the choir stood proud to him and tune his youthful lyre. Then thus the thunderer checks the imperial dame, let not thy wrath the court of heaven inflame, their merits nor their honours are the same. But mine, and every god's peculiar grace Hector deserves of all the Trojan race, still on our shrines his grateful offerings lay, the only honours men to gods can pay, nor ever from our smoking altar cease the pure libation and the holy feast. Howe'er by stealth to snatch the course away we will not. Thetis guards it night and day, but haste and summon to our courts above the azure queen. Let her persuasion move her furious son from Priam to receive the proffered ransom, and the course to leave. He added not, and Iris from the sky, swift as a whirlwind on the message flies, Meteorus, the face of ocean sweeps, refulgent, gliding o'er the sable deeps, between where Samos wide his forest spreads, and rocky Imbrus lifts its pointed heads. Down plunged the maid, the parted waves resound. She plunged, and instant shot the dark profound, as bearing death in the fallacious bait, from the bent angle sinks the leaden weight. So passed the goddess through the closing wave, where Thetis sorrowed in her secret cave. There placed amidst her melancholy train, the blue-haired sisters of the sacred main, pensive she sat, revolving fates to come, and wept her godlike son's approaching doom. Then thus the goddess of the painted bow, Arise, O Thetis, from thy seats below, tis Jove that calls, and why, the dame replies, calls Jove, his Thetis, to the hated skies? Sad object as I am for heavenly sight. Ah, may my sorrows ever shun the light. Howe'er be heaven's Almighty sire obeyed, she spake, and veiled her head in sable shade, which flowing long her graceful person clad, and forth she paced majestically sad. Then through the world of waters they repair. The way fair Iris led to upper air, the deeps dividing o'er the coast they rise, and touch with momentary flight the skies. There in the lightning's blaze the sire they found, and all the gods in shining synod round. They approached with anguish in her face. Minerva rising gave the mourner place. Even Juno sought her sorrows to console, and offered from her hand the nectar bowl. She tasted and resigned it, then began, the sacred sire of gods and mortal man. Thou comest, fair Thetis, but with grief o'ercast. Maternal sorrows, long, ah, long to last. Suffice, we know, and we partake thy cares, but yield to fate, and hear what Jove declares. Nine days are past, since all the court above in Hector's cause have moved the ear of Jove. "'Twas voted, Hermes from his godlike foe by stealth should bear him, but we willed not so. We will thy son himself the course restore, and to his conquest add this glory more. Then hie thee to him, and our mandate bear. Tell him he tempts the wrath of heaven too far, nor let him more our anger if he dread vent his mad vengeance on the sacred dead. But yield to ransom and the father's prayer— the mournful father Iris shall prepare with gifts to sue, and offer to his hands whate'er his honour asks or heart demands. His word, the silver-footed queen attends, and from Olympus' snowy tops descends. Arrived, she heard the voice of loud lament, and echoing groans that shook the lofty tent. His friends prepare the victim, and dispose repast unheeded while he vents his woes. The goddess seats her by her pensive son— she pressed his hand, and tender thus begun. 
How long unhappy shall thy sorrows flow, and thy heart waste with life-consuming woe, mindless of food or love, whose pleasing rain soothes weary life and softens human pain? O oh, snatch the moments yet within thy power, not long to live, indulge the amorous hour, lo! Jove himself, for Jove's command I bear, forbids to tempt the wrath of heaven too far. No longer, then, his fury, if thou dread, detain the relics of great Hector dead." nor vent on senseless earth thy vengeance vain, but yield to ransom and restore the slain. To whom Achilles, be the ransom given, and we submit, since such the will of heaven. While thus they communed from the Olympian bowers, Jove orders Iris to the Trojan towers, haste winged goddess to the sacred town, and urge her monarch to redeem his son. Alone the Ilian ramparts let him leave, and bear what stern Achilles may receive. Alone, for so we will, no Trojan near except to place the dead with decent care. Some aged herald, who with gentle hand may the slow mules and funeral car command, nor let him death, nor let him danger dread, safe through the foe by our protection led, him Hermes to Achilles shall convey, god of his life and partner of his way. Fierce as he is, Achilles' self shall spare his age, nor touch one venerable hair. Some thought there must be in a soul so brave some sense of duty, some desire to save, then down her bow the winged iris drives, and swift at Priam's mournful court arrives, where the sad sons beside their father's throne sat bathed in tears, and answered groan with groan. And all amidst them lay the hoary sire, sad scene of woe, his face, his rapt attire, concealed from sight, with frantic hands he spread, a shower of ashes o'er his neck and head. From room to room his pensive daughters roam, whose shrieks and clamours fill the vaulted dome, mindful of those who late their pride and joy lie pale and breathless round the fields of Troy, before the king Jove's messenger appears, and thus in whispers greets his trembling ears. Fear not, O father, no ill news I bear, from Jove I come, Jove makes thee still his care, for Hector's sake these walls he bids thee leave, and bear what stern Achilles may receive. Alone, for so he wills no Trojan near, except to place the dead with decent care. Some aged herald, who with gentle hand may the slow mules and funeral car command. Nor shalt thou death, nor shall thou danger dread, safe through the foe by his protection led. Thee, Hermes, to Pelides shall convey, guard of thy life and partner of thy way. Fierce as he is, Achilles' self shall spare thy age, nor touch one venerable hair. Some thought there must be in a soul so brave some sense of duty, some desire to save. She spoke and vanished. Priam bids prepare his gentle mules and harness to the car. There for the gifts a polished casket lay. His pious sons the king's command obey. Then passed the monarch to his bridal room, where cedar beams the lofty rooms perfume, and where the treasures of his empire lay. Then called his queen, and thus began to say— Unhappy consort of a king distressed, partake the troubles of thy husband's breast. I saw descend the messenger of Jove, who bids me try Achilles' mind to move. Forsake these ramparts, and with gifts obtain the course of Hector at yon navy slain. Tell me thy thought, my heart impels to go through hostile camps, and bears me to the foe. The hoary monarch thus, her piercing cries sad Hecuba renews, and then replies, Ah! Whither wanders thy distempered mind, and where the prudence now that awed mankind? Through Phrygia once, and foreign regions know now, all confused, distracted, or thrown, singly to pass through hosts of foes? To face, O oh heart of steel, the murderer of thy race? To view that deathful eye, and wander o'er those hands yet red with Hector's noble gore? Alas, my lord, he knows not how to spare, and what his mercy thy slain sons declare, so brave so many fallen— to claim his rage, vain were thy dignity, and vain thy age. No pent in this sad palace let us give to grief the wretched days we have to live. Still, still for Hector let our sorrows flow, born to his own and to his parents' woe, doomed from the hour his luckless life begun, to dogs, to vultures, and to Peleus' son. Oh, in his dearest blood might I allay my rage, and these barbarities repay. For ah, could Hector matter thus, whose breath expired not meanly in unactive death, he poured his latest blood in manly fight, and fell a hero in his country's right. Seek not to stay with me, 
nor my soul affright with words of omen like a bird of night, replied unmoved the venerable man. Tis heaven commands me, and you urge in vain. Had any mortal voice the injunction laid, nor augur, priest, nor seer had been obeyed, a present goddess brought the high command, I saw, I heard her, and the word shall stand, I go, ye gods, obedient to your call. If in yon camp your powers have doomed my fall, content by the same hand let me expire, add to the slaughtered son the wretched sire. One cold embrace at least may be allowed, and my last tears flow mingled with his blood. From forth his open stores, this said, he drew twelve costly carpets of refulgent yew, as many vests, as many mantles told, and twelve fair veils and garments stiff with gold. Two tripods next, and twice two chargers shine, with ten pure talents from the richest mine. And last, a large, well-laboured bowl had place, the pledge of treaties once with friendly thrace. Seemed all too mean the stores he could employ for one last look to buy him back to Troy. Lo, the sad father, frantic with his pain, around him furious drives his menial train. In vain each slave with duteous care attends, each office hurts him, and each face offends. "'What make ye here, officious crowds?' he cries. "'Hence, nor obtrude your anguish on my eyes. Have ye no griefs at home to fix ye there? Am I the only object of despair? Am I become my people's common show, set up by Jove your spectacle of woe? No!' You must feel him too, yourselves must fall. The same stern God to ruin gives you all. Nor is great Hector lost by me alone. Your sole defence, your guardian power is gone. I see your blood, the fields of Phrygia drown. I see the ruins of your smoking town. Oh, send me gods, ere that sad day shall come, a willing ghost to Pluto's dreary home. He said, and feebly drives his friends away. The sorrowing friends his frantic rage obey. Next on his sons his erring fury falls. Polites, Paris, Agathon he calls. His threats, Deophobus and Deos here, Hippothus, Pabon, Helenes, the seer, and generous Antiphon, for yet these nine survived sad relics of his numerous line. Inglorious sons of an unhappy sire, why did not all in Hector's cause expire? Wretch that I am, my bravest offspring slain, you— the disgrace of Priam's house remain. Mestor the brave, renowned in ranks of war, with Troilus, dreadful on his rushing car, and last great Hector more than man divine, for sure he seemed not of terrestrial line. All those relentless maws untimely slew, and left me these, a soft and servile crew, whose days the feast and wanton dance employ, gluttons and flatterers, the contempt of Troy. Why teach ye not my rapid wheels to run, and speed my journey to redeem my son?' The sons their father's wretched age revere, who give his anger and produce the car. High on the seat the cabinet they bind, the new-made car with solid beauty shined. Box was the yoke, embossed with costly panes, and hung with ringlets to receive the reins. Nine cubits long, the traces swept the ground. These to the chariot's polished pole they bound. Then fixed a ring the running reins to guide, and close beneath the gathered ends were tied. Next with the gifts— the price of Hector slain, the sad attendants load the groaning wain. Last to the yoke, the well-matched mules they bring, the gift of Mycia to the Trojan king. But the fair horses, long his darling care, himself received and harnessed to his car. Grieved as he was, he not this task denied. The hoary herald helped him at his side, while careful these the gentle courses joined, sad Hecuba approached with anxious mind. A golden bowl, that foamed with fragrant wine, libation, destined to the power divine, held in her right before the steed she stands, and thus consigns it to the monarch's hands. Take this, and pour to Jove, that safe from harms, his grace restore thee to our roof and arms, since victor of thy fears and slighting mine, heaven, or thy soul inspires this bold design. Pray to that god who high on Ida's brow surveys thy desolated realms below, his winged messenger to send from high, and lead thy way with heavenly augury. Let the strong sovereign of the plumier race tower on the right of yon ethereal space. That sign be held and strengthened from above. Boldly pursue the journey marked by Jove. But— if the god his augury denies, suppress thy impulse nor reject advice, tis just, 
said Priam, to the sire above to raise our hands, for who so good as Jove? He spoke, and bade the attendant handmaid bring the purest water of the living spring. Her ready hands the ewer and basin held, then took the golden cup his queen had filled. On the mid-pavement pours the rosy wine, uplifts his eyes and calls the power divine. O first and greatest, heaven's imperial lord, on lofty Ida's holy hill adored, to stone Achilles now direct my ways, and teach him mercy when a father prays. If such thy will dispatch from yonder sky, thy sacred bird celestial augury, let the strong sovereign of the plumy race tower on the right of yon ethereal space. So shall thy suppliant, strengthened from above, fearless pursue the journey marked by Jove. Jove heard his prayer, and from the throne on high dispatched his bird celestial augury, the swift-winged chaser of the feathered game, and known to gods by Perknos' lofty name, wide as appears some palace gate displayed, so broad his pinions stretched their ample shade, as stooping Dexter with resounding wings, the imperial bird descends in airy rings, a dawn of joy in every face appears, the morning matron dries her timorous tears, swift on his car the impatient monarch sprung, the brazen portal in his passage rung. The mules proceeding draw the loaded wain. Charged with the gifts, Adeus holds the rein. The king himself his gentle steeds controls, and through surrounding friends the chariot rolls. On his slow wheels the following people wait, mourn at each step, and give him up to fate. With hands uplifted eye him as he passed, and gaze upon him as they gazed their last. Now forward fares the father on his way, through the lone fields, and back to Ilion they. Great Jove beheld him as he crossed the plain, and felt the woes of miserable man. Then thus to Hermes, Thou, whose constant cares still succour mortals, and attend their prayers, behold, an object to thy charge consigned, if ever pity touch thee for mankind. Go, guard the sire, the observing foe prevent, and safe conduct him to Achilles' tent. The god obeys, his golden pinions binds, and mounts incumbent on the wings of winds, that high through fields of air his flight sustain, o'er the wide earth and o'er the boundless main, then grasps the wand that causes sleep to fly, or in soft slumbers seals the wakeful eye. Thus armed, swift Hermes steers his airy way, and stoops on Hellespont's resounding sea, a beauteous youth, majestic and divine, he seemed fair, offspring of some princely line, now twilight veiled the glaring face of day, and clad the dusky fields in sober grey. What time the herald and the hoary king, their chariots stopping at the silver spring, that circling Illus's ancient marble flows, allowed their mules and steeds a short repose? Through the dim shade the herald first espies a man's approach, and thus to Priam cries, I mark some foe's advance, O king, beware! This hard adventure claims thy utmost care." For much I fear destruction hovers nigh. Our state asks counsel. Is it best to fly, or old and helpless, at his feet to fall, two wretched suppliants, and for mercy call? The afflicted monarch shivered with despair. Pale grew his face, and upright stood his hair. Sunk was his heart, his colour went and came. A sudden trembling shook his aged frame, when Hermes' greeting touched his royal hand, and gentle, thus accosts with kind demand. Say whither, father— when each mortal sight is sealed in sleep, thou wanderest through the night. Why roam thy mules and steeds the plains along, through Grecian foes so numerous and so strong? What couldst thou hope, should these thy treasures view, these, who with endless hate thy race pursue? For what defence, alas, couldst thou provide, thyself not young, a weak old man thy guide? Yet suffer not thy soul to sink with dread, from me no harm shall touch thy revered head. From Greece— I'll guard thee too, for in those lines the living image of my father shines. Thy words that speak benevolence of mind are true, my son, the godlike sire rejoined. Great are my hazards, but the gods survey my steps and send thee, guardian of my way. Hail and be blessed, for scarce of mortal kind appear thy form, thy feature, and thy mind. Nor true are all thy words, nor erring wide the sacred messenger of heaven replied, but say, conveyest thou through the lonely plains what yet most precious of thy store remains, to lodge in safety with some friendly hand, prepared perchance to leave thy native land, or fliest thou now? What hopes can Troy retain thy matchless son, 
her guard and glory slain. The king, alarmed, Say what, and whence thou art, who search the sorrows of a parent's heart, and know so well how godlike Hector died? Thus Priam spoke, and Hermes thus replied, You tempt me, father, and with pity touch. On this sad subject you inquire too much. Oft have these eyes that godlike Hector viewed in glorious fight with Grecian blood imbrued. I saw him when, like Jove, his flames he tossed on thousands of ships, and withered half a cost I saw, but helped not. Stern Achilles' ire forbade assistance and enjoyed the fire. For him I serve of Myrmidonian race. One ship conveyed us from our native place. Polyctor is my sire, an honoured name, old like thyself, and not unknown to fame. Of seven his sons, by whom the lot was cast to serve our prince, it fell on me the last. To watch this quarter my adventure falls. For with the morn the Greeks attack your walls, sleepless they sit, impatient to engage, and scarce their rulers check their martial rage. If then thou art of stern Pelides' train, the mournful monarch thus rejoined again, Ah, tell me truly, where, oh, where are laid my son's dear relics? What befalls him dead? Have dogs dismembered him on the naked plains, or yet unmangled rest his cold remains? O favoured of the skies, thus answered then the power that mediates between God and men, nor dogs nor vultures have thy Hector rent, but whole he lies, neglected in the tent. This, the twelfth evening since he rested there, untouched by worms, untainted by the air, Aurora's ruddy beam spread round his friend's tomb, Achilles drags the dead. Yet, undisfigured, or in limb or face, all fresh he lies with every living grace, majestical in death. No stains are found o'er all the course, and closed is every wound, though many a wound they gave. Some heavenly care, some hand divine, preserves him ever fair, or all the host of heaven to whom he led a life so grateful still regard him dead." Thus spoke to Priam, the celestial guide, and joyful thus the royal sire replied, Blessed is the man who pays the gods above the constant tribute of respect and love, those who inhabit the Olympian bower, my son forgot not in exalted power, and heaven, that every virtue bears in mind, even to the ashes of the just is kind, but thou, O generous youth, this goblet take, a pledge of gratitude for Hector's sake, and while the favouring gods our steps survey, safe to Pelides' tent conduct my way. To whom the latent god? O king, forbear to tempt my youth, for apt is youth to err. But can I, absent from my prince's sight, take gifts in secret that must shun the light? What from our master's interest thus we draw is but a licensed theft that scapes the law. Respecting him my soul abjures the offence, and as the crime I dread the consequence. Thee, far as Argos pleased, I could convey— guard of thy life, and partner of thy way. On thee attend thy safety to maintain, or pathless forests, or the roaring main, he said. Then took the chariot at a bound, and snatched the reins, and whirled the lash around. Before the inspiring god that urged them on, the coursers fly with spirit, not their own. And now they reached the naval walls, and found the gods repasting while the bowls go round. On these the virtue of his wand he tries, and pours deep slumber on their watchful eyes. Then heaved the massy gates, removed the bars, and all the trenches led the rolling cars. Unseen through all the hostile camp they went, and now approached Pelides' lofty tent. On firs the roof was raised, and covered o'er with reeds collected from the marshy shore, and fenced with palisades, a hall of state, the work of soldiers, where the hero sat. Large was the door, whose well-compacted strength a solid pine-tree barred of wondrous length, Scarce three strong Greeks could lift its mighty weight, but great Achilles singly closed the gate. This Hermes, such the power of God, set wide, then swift alighted the celestial guide, and thus revealed, Hear, prince, and understand, thou owest thy guidance to no mortal hand. Hermes I am, descended from above, the king of arts, the messenger of Jove. Farewell. To shun Achilles' sight I fly, uncommon are such favours of the sky, nor stand confessed to frail mortality, now, fearless, enter, and prefer thy prayers. Adjure him by his father's silver hairs, his son, his mother. Urge him to bestow whatever pity that stern heart can know. Thus having said, he vanished from his eyes, and in a moment shot into the skies. The king, confirmed from heaven, alighted there, and left his aged herald on the car. With solemn pace through various rooms he went, and found Achilles in his inner tent. There sat the hero, Alcimus the brave, and great Automedon attendance gave. 
These served his person at the royal feast. Around at awful distance stood the rest. Unseen by these the king his entry made, and prostrate now before Achilles laid. Sudden, a venerable sight, appears, embraced his knees and bathed his hands in tears. Those direful hands his kisses pressed, embrued, even with the best, the dearest of his blood. As when a wretch, who, conscious of his crime, pursued for murder, flies his native clime, just gains some frontier, breathless, pale, amazed, all gaze, all wonder. Thus Achilles gazed, thus stood the attendants, stupid with surprise, all mute, yet seemed to question with their eyes. Each looked on other, none the silence broke, till thus at last the kingly suppliant spoke. All think, thou favoured of the powers divine. Think of thy father's age, and pity mine. In me that father's reverend image trace, those silver hairs, that venerable face, his trembling limbs, his helpless person, see, in all my equal but in misery, yet now, perhaps some turn of human fate expels him, helpless from his peaceful state, think from some powerful foe thou seest him fly, and beg protection with a feeble cry, yet still one comfort in his soul may rise, he hears his son, still lives to glad his eyes, and hearing still, may hope a better day, may send him thee to chase that foe away. No comfort to my griefs, no hopes remain, the best, the bravest of my sons are slain. Yet what a race, ere Greece to Ilion came, the pledge of many a loved and loving dame, nineteen, one mother bore, dead, all are dead. How oft, alas, has wretched Priam bled! Still one was left their loss to recompense, his father's hope, his country's last defence. Him too thy rage is slain beneath thy steel, unhappy in his country's cause he fell. For him through hostile camps I bent my way. For him thus prostrate at thy feet I lay. Large gifts proportioned to thy wrath I bear. O oh, hear the wretched and the gods revere. Think of thy father, and this face behold, see him in me as helpless and as old, though not so wretched, there he yields to me, the first of men in sovereign misery, thus forced to kneel, thus groveling to embrace, the scourge and ruin of my realm and race, suppliant my children's murderer to implore, and kiss those hands yet reeking with their gore. These words, soft pity in the chief inspire, touched with the dear remembrance of his sire, then with his hand, as prostrate still he lay, the old man's cheek he gently turned away. Now each by turns indulged the gush of woe, and now the mingled tides together flow, this low on earth, that gently bending o'er, a father one and one a son deplore. But great Achilles' different passions rend, and now his sire he mourns, and now his friend. The infectious softness through the heroes ran, one universal solemn shower began, they bore as heroes, but they felt as man. Satiate at length with unavailing woes, from the high throne divine Achilles rose, the reverend monarch by the hand he raised, on his white beard and form majestic gazed, not unrelenting, then serene began with words to soothe the miserable man. Alas, what weight of anguish hast thou known, unhappy prince, thus guardless and alone, to pass through foes, and thus undaunted face the man whose fury has destroyed thy race. Heaven sure has armed thee with a heart of steel, a strength proportioned to the woes you feel. Rise, then, let reason mitigate your care. To mourn avails not. Man is born to bear. Such is, alas, the God's severe decree. They, only they are blessed and only free. Two urns, by Jove's high throne have ever stood the source of evil, one and one of good. From thence the cup of mortal man he fills. Blessings to these, to those, distributes ill. To most he mingles both. The wretch decreed to taste the bad, unmixed is cursed indeed. Pursued by wrongs, by meagre famine driven, he wanders outcast both of earth and heaven. The happiest taste, not happiness sincere, but find the cordial draught is dashed with care, who more than Peleus shown in wealth and power... What stars concurring blessed his natal hour? A realm, a goddess to his wishes given, graced by the gods with all the gifts of heaven? One evil yet or takes his latest day, no race succeeding to imperial sway, an only son, and he, alas, ordained to fall untimely in a foreign land. 
See him, in Troy, the pious, care decline of his weak age to live the curse of thine. Thou too, old man, hast happier days beheld, in riches once, in children once excelled, extended Phrygia, owned thy ample reign, and all fair Lesbos blissful seats contain, and all wide Hellespont's unmeasured main. But since the god his hand has pleased to turn, and fill thy measure from his bitter urn, what sees the sun but hapless heroes falls, War and the blood of men surround thy walls. What must be, must be. Bear thy lot, nor shed these unavailing sorrows o'er the dead. Thou canst not call him from the Stygian shore, but thou, alas, mayest live to suffer more. To whom the king, O favoured of the skies, here let me grow to earth, since Hector lies on the bare beach deprived of obsequies. O give me Hector to my eyes restore his course, and take the gifts I ask no more. Thou, as thou mayest, these boundless stories enjoy. Safe mayest thou sail, and turn thy wrath from Troy. So shall thy pity and forbearance give a weak old man to see the light and live. Move me no more, Achilles thus replies, while kindling anger sparkled in his eyes, nor seek by tears my steady soul to bend. To yield thy Hector I myself intend, for know from Jove my goddess mother came, old ocean's daughter, silver-footed dame, nor comest thou but by heaven, nor comest alone, some god impels with courage not thy own. No human hand the weighty gates unbod, nor could the boldest of our youth have dared to pass our outer works, or elude the god. Cease, lest neglectful of high Jove's command, I show thee, king, thou treadest on hostile land. Release my knees, thy suppliant arts give o'er, and shake the purpose of my soul no more." The sire obeyed him, trembling and overawed. Achilles, like a lion, rushed abroad. Automedon and Alcimus attend, whom most he honoured since he lost his friend. These, to unyoke the mules and horse sorry Harold to the tent. Next, heaped on high the numerous presents, bear great Hector's ransom from the polished car, two splendid mantles and a carpet spread. They leave to cover and enwrap the dead, then call the handmaids with assistant toil to wash the body and anoint with oil. Apart from Priam, lest the unhappy sire, provoked to passion once more roused to ire, the stern Pelides, and nor sacred age nor Jove's command, should check the rising rage. This done, the garments o'er the course they spread. Achilles lifts it to the funeral bed. Then, while the body on the car they laid, he groans, and calls on loved Patroclus' shade. If in that gloom, which never light must know, the deeds of mortals touch the ghosts below, O friend, forgive me, that I thus fulfil, restoring Hector, heaven's unquestioned will. The gifts the Father gave be ever thine, to grace thy manes and adorn thy shrine. He said, and entering took his seat of state, where, full before him, reverend Priam sate, to whom composed the godlike chief begun, lo, to thy prayer restored, thy breathless son. Extended on the funeral couch he lies, and soon as mournful paints the eastern skies, the sight is granted to thy longing eyes. But now the peaceful hours of sacred night demand reflection, and to rest invite. Nor thou, O father, thus consumed with woe, the common cares that nourish life forego. Not thus did Niobe of form divine apparent once whose sorrows equaled thine. Six youthful sons, as many blooming maids, in one sad day beheld the Stygian shades, those by Apollo's silver bow were slain, these Cynthia's arrows stretched upon the plain. So was her pride chastised by wrath divine, who matched her own with bright Latona's line. But two, the goddess, twelve the queen enjoyed, those boasted twelve the avenging two destroyed, steeped in their blood and in the dust outspread, nine days neglected lay exposed the dead, none by to weep them, to inhume them none, for Jove had turned the nation all to stone. The gods themselves at length, relenting, gave the unhappy race the honours of a grave. Herself a rock, for such was heaven's high will, through deserts wild now pours a weeping rill, where round the bed whence Eclus springs the watery fairies dance in mazy rings, there high on Sipilus's shaggy brow. She stands, her own sad monument of woe, the rock forever lasts, the tears forever flow. Such griefs, O king, have other parents known, remember theirs and mitigate thy own. The care of heaven thy Hector has appeared, nor shall he lie unwept and uninterred. Soon may thy aged cheeks in tears be drowned, 
and all the eyes of Ilion stream around, he said, and rising, chose the victim hue with silver fleece, which his attendants slew. The limbs they sever from the reeking hide, with skill prepare them, and in parts divide. Each on the coals the separate morsels lays, and hasty snatches from the rising blaze, with bread the glittering canisters they load, which round the board Automedon bestowed. The chief himself to each his portion placed, and each indulging shared in sweet repast, when now the rage of hunger was repressed. The wandering hero eyes his royal guest. No less the royal guest the hero eyes, his godlike aspect and majestic size. Here youthful grace and noble fire engage, and there the mild benevolence of age. Thus, gazing long, the silence neither broke. A solemn scene. At length the father spoke. Permit me now, beloved of Jove, to steep my careful temples in the dew of sleep. For since the day that numbered with the dead my hapless son, the dust has been my bed. Soft sleep, a stranger to my weeping eyes, my only food, my sorrows, and my sighs. Till now, encouraged by the grace you give, I share thy banquet and consent to live. With that Achilles bade prepare the bed, with purple soft and shaggy carpet spread, forth by the flaming lights they bend their way, and place the couches and the coverings lay. Then he, now, father, sleep, but sleep not here. Consult thy safety and forgive my fear, lest any argive at this hour awake to ask our counsel or our orders take. Approaching sudden to our open tent, perchance behold thee and our grace prevent. Should such report thy honoured person hear the king of men, the ransom might defer. But say with speed, if aught of thy desire remains unasked, what time the rites require to inter thy Hector, for so long we stay our slaughtering arm, and bid the hosts obey. If then thy will permit, the monarch said, to finish all due honours to the dead, this of thy grace accord to thee are known the fears of Ilion, closed within her town, and at what distance from our walls aspire the hills of Ida, and forests for the fire. Nine days to vent our sorrows I request, the tenth shall see the funeral and the feast, the next to raise his monument be given, the twelfth we war, if war be doomed by heaven. This thy request, replied the chief, enjoy, till then our arms suspend the fall of Troy." Then gave his hand at parting to prevent the old man's fears, and turned within the tent, where fair Briseis, bright in blooming charms, expects her hero with desiring arms. But in the porch the king and herald rest, sad dreams of care yet wandering in their breast. Now gods and men the gifts of sleep partake. Industrious Hermes only was awake, the king's return, revolving in his mind, to pass the ramparts and the watch to blind. The power descending hovered o'er his head, and sleepest thou, father, thus the vision said, now dost thou sleep when Hector is restored, nor fear the Grecian foes or Grecian lord? Thy presence here should stern Atreides see, thy still surviving sons may sue for thee, may offer all thy treasures yet contain to spare thy age, and offer all in vain. Waked with the word, the trembling sire arose, and raised his friend, the god before him goes, he joins the mules, directs them with his hand, and moves in silence through the hostile land. When now to Xanthus' yellow stream they drove, Xanthus, immortal progeny of Jove, the winged deity forsook their view, and in a moment to Olympus flew. Now shed Aurora round her saffron ray, sprang through the gates of light, and gave the day, charged with the mournful load to Ilion go, the sage and king, majestically slow. Cassandra first beholds from Ilion's spire the sad procession of her hoary sire. Then, as the pensive pomp advanced more near, her breathless brother stretched upon the bier. A shower of tears o'erflows her beauteous eyes. Alarming thus, O Ilion, with her cries, turn here your steps, and here your eyes employ, ye wretched daughters, and ye sons of Troy, if e'er ye rushed in crowds with vast delight to hail your hero glorious from the fight, now meet him dead." and let your sorrows flow, your common triumph and your common woe. In thronging crowds they issue to the plains, nor man nor woman in the walls remains. In every face the selfsame grief is shown, and Troy sends forth one universal groan. At Scaea's gates they meet the morning wane, hang on the wheels and grovel round the slain. The wife and mother, frantic with despair, kiss his pale cheek and rend their scattered hair. Thus 
Wildly wailing at the gates they lay, And there had sighed and sorrowed out the day. But godlike Priam from the chariot rose, Forbear, he cried, this violence of woes. First to the palace let the car proceed, Then pour your boundless sorrows o'er the dead. The waves of people at his word divide, Slow rolls the chariot through the following tide. Even to the palace the sad pomp they wait, They weep and place him on the bed of state. A melancholy choir attend around with plaintive sighs and music solemn sound. Alternately they sing, alternate flow the obedient tears, melodious in their woe, while deeper sorrows groan from each full heart, and nature speaks at every pause of art. First to the course the weeping consort flew, around his neck her milk white arm she threw, and, O oh, my Hector, O oh, my Lord, she cries, snatched in thy bloom from these desiring eyes. Thou to the dismal realms forever gone, and I abandoned, desolate, alone, and only son, once comfort of our pains, sad product now of hapless love remains. Never to manly age that sun shall rise, or with increasing graces glad my Ilion now her great defence, and a slain shall sink a smoking ruin on the plain, who now protects her wives with guardian care, who saves her infants from the rage of war. Now hostile fleets must waft. Those infants o'er, those wives must wait them to a foreign shore. Thou too, my son, to barbarous climes shall go, the sad companion of thy mother's woe, driven hence a slave before the victor's sword, condemned to toil for some inhuman lord, or else some Greek whose father pressed the plain, or son or brother by great Hector slain. In Hector's blood his vengeance shall enjoy, and hurl thee headlong from the towers of Troy. For thy stern father never spared a foe. Thence all these tears and all this scene of woe, Thence many evils his sad parents bore, His parents many, but his consort more. Why gavest thou not to me thy dying hand, And why received not I thy last command? Some word thou wouldst have spoke, Which sadly, dear, my soul might keep, Or utter with a tear, which never, never could be lost in air, Fixed in my heart and oft repeated there. Thus to her weeping maids she makes her moan, the weeping handmaids echo groan for groan. The mournful mother next sustains her part. O oh, thou, the best, the dearest to my heart, Of all my race thou most by heaven approved, And by the immortals even in death beloved, While all my other sons in barbarous bands Achilles bound and sold to foreign lands, This felt no change, but went a glorious ghost, Free and a hero to the Stygian coast. Sentenced, tis true, by his inhuman doom, Thy noble course was dragged round the tomb, the tomb of him thy warlike arm had slain, ungenerous insult, impotent and vain, yet glowest thou fresh with every living grace, no mark of pain or violence of face, rosy and fair as Phoebus' silver bow, dismissed thee gently to the shades below. Thus spoke the dame, and melted into tears. Sad Helen next in pomp of grief appears, fast from the shining sluices of her eyes fall the round crystal drops, while thus she cries. O oh, dearest friend, in whom the gods had joined, the mildest manners with the bravest mind, now twice ten years, unhappy years, are o'er since Paris brought me to the Trojan shore. O oh, had I perished ere that form divine seduced this soft, this easy heart of mine! It was it ne'er my fate from thee to find a deed ungentle or a word unkind, when others cursed the authoress of their woe. Thy pity checked my sorrows in their flow. If some proud brother eyed me with disdain, Or scornful sister with her sweeping train, Thy gentle accents softened all my pain. For thee I mourn, and mourn myself in thee, The wretched source of all this misery, The fate I caused forever I bemoan, Sad Helen has no friend, now thou art gone. Through Troy's wide streets abandoned shall I roam, In Troy deserted as a board at home. So spoke the fair with sorrow streaming eye, Distressful beauty melts each standard by. On all around the infectious sorrow grows, But Priam checked the torrent as it rose. Perform, ye Trojans, what the rites require, And fell the forests for a funeral pyre. Twelve days, nor foes nor secret ambush dread, Achilles grants these honours to the dead. He spoke, and at his word the Trojan train, Their mules and oxen harnessed to the wain, Pour through the gates, and felled from Ida's crown, Roll back the gathered forests to the town, 
These toils continue nine succeeding days, and high in air a sylvan structure raise. But when the tenth fair morn began to shine, forth to the pyre was borne the man divine, and placed aloft, while all with streaming eyes beheld the flames and rolling smokes arise. Soon, as Aurora, daughter of the dawn, with rosy luster, streaked the dewy lawn, again the mournful crowd surround the pyre, and quench with wine the yet remaining fire. The snowy bones his friends and brothers place with tears collected in a golden vase. The golden vase in purple paws they rolled, of softest texture and inwrought with gold. Last o'er the urn the sacred earth they spread, and raised the tomb memorial of the dead. Strong guards and spies, till all the rites were done, watched from the rising to the setting sun. All Troy then moves to Priam's court again, a solemn silent melancholy train, assembled there from pious toil they rest, and sadly shared the last sepulchral fest. Such honours Ilion to her hero paid, and peaceful slept the mighty Hector's shade. The end of Book 24 of the Iliad by Homer As translated by Alexander Pope Read by Rick Kirchner for Litigo on the web at fcit.usf.edu the Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope. Concluding Note We have now passed through the Iliad and seen the anger of Achilles and the terrible effects of it at an end, as that only was the subject of the poem, and the nature of epic poetry would not permit our author to proceed to the event of the war. It perhaps may be acceptable to the common reader to give a short account of what happened to Troy and the chief actors in this poem after the conclusion of it. I need not mention that Troy was taken soon after the death of Hector by the stratagem of the wooden horse, the particulars of which are described by Virgil in the second book of the Aeneid. Achilles fell before Troy by the hand of Paris, by the shot of an arrow in his heel, as Hector had prophesied at his death. The unfortunate Priam was killed by Pyrrhus, the son of Achilles. Ajax, after the death of Achilles, had a contest with Ulysses for the armor of Vulcan, but, being defeated in his aim, he slew himself through indignation. Helen, after the death of Paris, married Deiphobus, his brother, and, at the taking of Troy, betrayed him, in order to reconcile herself to Menelaus, her first husband, who received her again into favor. Agamemnon, at his return, was barbarously murdered by Aegisthus at the instigation of Clytemnestra, his wife, who in his absence had dishonored his bed with Aegisthus. Diomed, after the fall of Troy, was expelled his own country, and scarce escaped with his life from his adulterous wife Agile, but at last was received by Donus in Apulia, and shared his kingdom. It is uncertain how he died. Nestor lived in peace with his children in Pylos, his native country. Ulysses, also after innumerable troubles by sea and land, at last returned in safety to Ithaca, which is the subject of Homer's Odyssey. For what remains I beg to be excused from the ceremonies of taking leave at the end of my work, and from embarrassing myself or others with any defences or apologies about it. But instead of endeavouring to raise a vain monument to myself of the merits or difficulties of it, which must be left to the world, to truth, and to posterity, let me leave behind me a memorial of my friendship with one of the most valuable of men, as well as finest writers of my age and country, one who has tried and knows by his own experience how hard an undertaking it is to do justice to Homer, and one whom, I am sure, sincerely rejoices with me at the period of my labours. To him, therefore, having brought this long work to a conclusion, I desire to dedicate it, and to have the honour and satisfaction of placing together in this manner the names of Mr. Congreve, and of March 25, 1720. Alexander Pope. The end of the concluding note to the Iliad by Homer as translated by Alexander Pope and read by Rick Kistner for Lit to Go on the Web at fcit.usf.edu.